starting off this countdown, we have the North Berwick Witches. North Berwick is a small town in Scotland where some of the most brutal and horrific witch trials took place. It all started during the reign of King James VI. While on his way to get his new bride in 1589, he encountered a series of disastrous storms. In fact, the storms were so bad that he was forced to head back home. He immediately thought that the storms were the work of witches. It didn't help that back then a rumor had started that a witch had sailed out on the river forth to conjure up some storms. So from then on, King James was dead set on finding these witches. In fact, 70 to 200 women were accused of being witches. Most of them were tortured and then executed. Now, apparently during these trials, he did come across a number of women that admitted to being witches. They claimed that they had all made deals with the devil and were now under his command. They also claimed that they would use one of the churches there to hold their covens. They even said that this was the place where they had summoned the devil himself. In fact, this church was located right on the seafront, so James was like, aha! The perfect place to conjure up storms. All of you are guilty. As a result, these witches were strangled and then burnt at the stake. In our fourth spot today, we have Sabrina Spellman. Although she's a fictional character, Sabrina still deserves a spot on today's list. Without too many spoilers, the show The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina is about Sabrina, a teenage witch who on her 16th birthday has to sign her name in the Book of the Beast. Upon doing so, she makes a deal with Satan. She basically gives herself to him in exchange for magical powers. At first, Sabrina refused to do so because she didn't want to give up her mortal life. But later on, she was forced into doing it in order to stop a number of evil forces that were murdering many of the townsfolk. Once she signed the book, she is forced to do Satan's bidding. She has to basically bow down to him and do whatever he instructs her to do. In return, Sabrina's magic became even stronger. In fact, she became the fourth witch in all of history to summon demonic blue hellfire, which was then used in order to fight off the Greendale 13. And for her to do that as a relatively new witch, is very impressive. Later on in the show, we also realize that Miss Wardwell is evil and is using Sabrina so she can become the Queen of Hell. Sabrina's destiny took a dark shift as soon as she made a deal with the Dark Lord. Although all the witches in the series have signed this book, the Dark Lord specifically needed Sabrina to sign it. Her destiny is far more different than the other witches in the show. Have you guys watched the show? Let me know in the comments below. Honestly, I did, but after season two, I just... I couldn't anymore. Let me know your thoughts though. Number three, the Munich Manual of Demonic Magic. Try saying that five times fast. The MMDM or Liber Incantatonium Exorcium et Fascinatum Variagium is a 15th century grimoire manuscript. The text composed in Latin is largely concerned with demonology and necromancy. Richard Kiekeffer edited the text of the manuscript in 1998 under the title Forbidden Rites, a Necromancer's Manual of the 15th Century. Portions of the text in English translation are presented in Forbidden Rites as well, embedded with the author's essays and explanations on the Munich Manual in specific and grimoires in general. The Russian translation of this Latin grimoire was published in 2019, while the first English translation was published in only 2023. There was only one known surviving manuscript of the original Munich Manual, which is almost complete, except for the first two folios that describe the beginning of the first ritual. The rest of the grimoire contains complete instructions for the invocation of demons such as Satan, Lilith, Astaroth, and Samael, as well as the supposed attainment of favors and supernatural powers from them. Some of the spells allow for obtaining the love of a woman, achieving invisibility, acquiring wealth and treasures, or gaining knowledge. The text is accompanied by over 40 illustrations of magic circles and symbols to be used in the rituals. Page 130 to 133 of the text include a list of 11 demons, similar to the one from the Ars Goetia. Since there are only 11, I guess I could list them all off. So Count slash Duke Barbarus, Duke Casson, President slash Count Odius, King Kirsten, Duke Alugar, Prince Diob, President Volak, Duke Ganeron, Marquise Tuveries, President Hani, and Marquise Sukax. I promise I did my best with pronunciations today, folks. I'm a little sleepy. Most of the text is in Latin, with the exception of the two appended materials in German and Italian, which, hey, makes sense to me. Number two, the Grimorium Verum. Yep, I've already mentioned it today. I know. The Grimorium Verum, which is Latin for true grimoire, is an 18th century grimoire attributed to one Ali Beck the Egyptian of Memphis, who wrote it in 1517. And like many of the other ones on today's list, it does claim a tradition originating with King Solomon. The grimoire is not a translation of an earlier work, with its original appearing in French or Italian in the mid 18th century, as noted already by A. E. Waite, who discussed the work in his book of ceremonial magic in 1911, stating the date specified in the title of the grimoire 
Memoriam Verum is undeniably fraudulent, since the work belongs to the middle of the 18th century in Memphis' Rome. One version of the grimoire was included as the Clavicles of King Solomon, Book 3, and one of the French manuscripts S. L. McGregor Mathers incorporated in his version of the Key of Solomon, but it was omitted from the key with his explanation. At the end, there are some short extracts from the Grimoire Verum with the seals of evil spirits, which as they do not belong to the Key of Solomon proper, I have not given. For evident classification of the key is in two books and no more. Now, Idris Shah also published some of it in The Secret Lore of Magic, Book of the Sorcerers in 1957. Alrighty, time to break down all four books. So book one is described as concerning the characters of demons, particularly the superior spirits of Lucifer, Beelzebub, Astaroth, while also including the many inferior spirits below them and their invoking sigils. Who wants to hear about what all the lesser spirits can do? So Klonek has the power to bring money to those who make a pact with them. Musisin has power over important people and politicians. Fremos has power over women. Klepoth can help you experience all sorts of dreams and visions. Kill can manifest dramatic situations and changes. Mersild has dominion over long and short distance travel. Clisthard can create confusion or enlightenment, depending on what you want or need. Sir Cod can make you see all sorts of natural and supernatural creatures. Hickpath can make a person think of you, no matter how far or distant they may be. Humots can bring you any bug you desire. Sigal will cause all sorts of prodigies to appear. Frusisier can teach you the art of necromancy. Gulan causes all illnesses. Sergak can create every kind of opportunity for advancement. Morel can help you move about unseen. Frutimier prepares all kinds of feasts for you. Husi Targaraz causes sleep in the case of some and insomnia in others. It tempted. I could use a good night's sleep. Book two is simply described as being of planetary hours, so I'll leave it up to y'all to interpret what you think that means. Book three is the preparation of the operator, or more simply put, how to prepare for summoning. Book four contains a sanctum regnum, called the Royalty of Spirits or the Little Key of Solomon, a most learned Hebraic necromancer and rabbi. This book contains various combinations of characters whereby the powers can be invoked or brought forth whensoever you may wish, each according to his faculty. Number one, Shams al -Harif. So, Shams al Marif or Shams al Marif Walata if al Arif is a 13th century grimoire centered on Arabic magic and claimed to be a manual for achieving esoteric spirituality. I apologize from the bottom of my heart if I butchered that pronunciation anyway. I promise I did practice. It was written by the scholar Ahmad al Buni, who wrote it while living in Algeria, and he passed around 1225 Common Era. This book is a patchwork of bits and pieces of al Buni's authentic works and texts by other authors. Scholars like Ibn Taminya have criticized the book and labeled al Buni as a deluded devil worshipper. Ah, good to know that across all religions over time, some things never change. In terms of more modern examples, that was a common assumption from Ed and Lorraine Warren, probably the most famed demonologist of all time. Personally, I believe half of what they investigated was real, and the other half was them just making a living, which at the end of the day, I have to give some respect to. Well, minus viewing alternate lifestyles outside of Christianity as a sin. Pardon me, I got a little sidetracked here. In contemporary form, the book consists of two volumes, the Shams al-Marif al-Kubra and the Shams al-Marif al-Sugra, with the former being the larger of the two. The first few chapters introduce the reader to magic squares and the combination of numbers in the alphabet that are believed to bring magical effect, which the author claims is the only way to communicate with jinn, angels, and spirits. The table of contents that were introduced in the later printed editions of the work contain a list of unnumbered chapters, which stretch to a number of 40. However, prior to the printing press and, you know, various other standardizations, there were three independent volumes that circulated, each one differing in length. While being popular, it also carries a notorious reputation for being suppressed and banned from much of Islamic history, ergo how it found its way to our list today. However, it continues to persist in being read and studied up to the present day, despite its questionable veracity and negative implications. Some Sufi orders, such as the Things I Cannot Say order, have recognized its legitimacy and use as a compendium for the occult and hold it in high regard. Another title by the same author, the title having been translated to The Source of the Essentials of Wisdom, is considered its companion text. In terms of translations, although a formal translation into English hasn't happened yet, there have been numerous renditions of a few of the more popular rituals found within the main treaties, as well as those that lie in its accompanying text. Kicking off our list today, we have Guy Spademanger, one of the first women executed for sorcery in Denmark and in Scandinavia. In 1543, King Christian III of Denmark equipped a fleet of 40 ships to chase away an imperial Dutch fleet from the coast of Norway to the Netherlands. Outside of Helsinga, his fleet was stuck in a calm and the whole project failed. Soon, a merchant's wife named Guy Spademanger was arrested and tortured believed to have gathered a group of witches in a valley outside the city and enchanted the ships. She eventually admitted to conducting a spell with a coven on a hill above Elsinore and named several more people that were involved, male and female, including vicars, which led to the expansion of the witch trial. 
Her trial was handled by the royal governor, Esquibil. She also said that the enchantments would never disappear unless Guide herself was allowed to remove them personally. The people that she named were arrested and tortured to an extent, quoted as, so hard their limbs were separated, but none other than Guide confessed. In November of 1543, the king demanded for the rightful old principle of witches to be burned, but she sadly suffered through further interrogations first before meeting the end of her time. In fourth place, we have Agnes Sampson. Starting off this tale, when King James decided to marry Anne, Princess of Denmark, as quickly as he possibly could, this wedding was arranged in Denmark, with a proxy standing in for him since he was, you know, located in Scotland. Anne's attempts to join her new husband across the ocean were severely delayed by dangerous and life-threatening storms, so, uh, he eventually decided to join her instead. After another wedding ceremony, which the king actually attended, the couple decided to head home to Scotland, with yet another storm plaguing their journey. Witchcraft trials had already begun in Denmark, remember, guide? You know, I mentioned a minute ago? And the king had taken note, so when it was reported to him that witches East Lothian conspired to cause the treacherous weather that threatened not just his life, but that of his, uh, way too young bride, he believed what he was told. Agnes Sampson was an elderly woman, who was known locally as a healer and a midwife, having cared for and successfully cured many neighbors of ailments throughout her life. She was a widow with several children living close to poverty in East Lothian. She had been suspected and investigated for witchcraft before, so there was no surprise locally that her name was given. After she was named, Agnes was quickly captured and protested her innocence. The new is from Scotland, which was an English written pamphlet that would have been written in London around 1591, says that Agnes was shaved from head to toe and each part of her body tortured for hours, intentionally to cause intense pain. The devil's mark was found, and she confessed, saying that she and hundreds of other witches attended North Berwick Kirk on Halloween night to meet with the devil to end the life of the king. She claimed the devil appeared to her as a black man, a dog, or a hayrick. Agnes also mentioned various attempts to obtain the king's shirt or other personal linens in order to work her charms. She had attended a witch's convent at North Berwick with her son-in-law, where they collected bones and powdered them for said charms. To prove her magical powers, she told the king the exact words that had passed between him and his new wife on their wedding night. Agnes's trial was presided over by a judge, with a jury of 17 men from East Lothian, many of whom would have known Agnes personally. After hearing the evidence, they found her guilty of 49 out of the 51 charges. In January of 1591, she was taken to Edinburgh Castle and met her end by way of a rope necklace, with her body then being burned at the stake. The naked ghost of a bald Agnes is said to roam the palace of Holyrood House, the official Scottish residence of the British monarchy. Let me know in the comments if you've ever been or if you've seen Agnes yourself. Moving on at number three, we have Lilith. Now, the description of Lilith varies depending on your beliefs. In Jewish folklore, Lilith is a female demon. In Luciferian witchcraft and Luciferianism, Lilith is described as the consort of Samael. Other people believe that she is the wife of Satan or that Lilith was the first wife of Adam. But she wasn't that obedient to him and Adam didn't like that, so Lilith left. Then God made Eve who was more obedient. Lilith became jealous and turned into the snake that made Eve take a bite from the apple. The two were banished from the Garden of Eden, and Lilith turned into a demon, her main goal, to get revenge on all men. Then you have the people that believe Lilith is a child-killing witch. She wasn't able to conceive, so she was jealous of pregnant women and would go around killing them or stealing their babies. In this case, we are looking at the version in which Lilith is a witch, obviously. In this case, Lilith is working alongside Satan to do his dark bidding for him. Their deal is that if she's with him, then she will work for him. But she's not always obedient, in fact, she has gotten frisky with other men. In the TV series Supernatural, Lilith is depicted as a white-eyed powerful demon. She is said to be the first human that made a deal with Satan and promised to serve him. As a result, she became the first demon. In The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, we end up finding out that one of the characters, Miss Wardwall, is actually Lilith. She is referred to as Satan's concubine and the mother of demons. And of course, she's a witch. In fact, she is said to be the first witch in existence. She made a deal with Satan or the Dark Lord. According to her story, she was wandering the wasteland aimlessly when she encountered Lucifer, the fallen angel. She made a deal to heal the wounds caused by the loss of his wings, if he in return helped her. She then pledged allegiance to him and became his handmaiden. In the end, Lilith wants to become his queen, which is why she goes to the extreme lengths to do whatever he tells her to do. Moving on to number two, we have Sarah Good. Now, if you have seen the Fear Street trilogy on Netflix, then chances are you might be a little familiar with this story. The movie was Lucy. 
loosely based off of the real witch, Sarah Good, but in the movie they changed her name to Sarah Fear. So Sarah was one of the first three women that were accused of witchcraft. It was her, Sarah Osborne, and Tachuba. These two other ladies were said to be real witches, and when they were accused, they brought forth Sarah Good's name saying that she was a witch too, little tattletailers. The townspeople were quick to believe this because Sarah never attended church. She lacked self-discipline and self-control, and she was 38, but apparently she looked like she was 70. That combined with the other ladies' testimonies had everyone against her. In fact, apparently when she was brought in front of the court, a number of witnesses began to twitch and rock back and forth and moan. So they were all like, damn, she's definitely a witch. Look at what she's doing to the people that accused her of being one. Not only that, but her own husband and daughter even admitted to Sarah being a witch as well. And then things kept getting worse and worse for her. At one point in her trial, one of the accusers started acting out and claimed that Sarah attacked her with a knife. In the end, of course, she was found guilty of witchcraft and was sentenced to death. But just before her death, she made a deal with the devil to curse a priest. She said, and I quote, I am no more a witch than you are a wizard, and if you take my life, God will give you blood to drink. Now when she died, apparently the priest and his land both became cursed, just like Sarah claimed it would. To this day, it's said that Sarah continues to haunt the town, searching for those that have wronged her. And in our number one spot today, we have the Bonus Witches. In 1679 in Bonus, Scotland, a number of women were accused of being witches. These women were Annabelle Thompson, Margaret Pringle, Margaret Hamilton, Bessie Yicker, and another woman named Margaret Hamilton. Now during this time, the hype and fear of witches was dying down. So people were shocked that out of nowhere five women were being accused. But rumor has it these women had renounced their baptisms and had been in contact with the devil on a number of occasions. They apparently had eaten, drank, danced, and had intercourse with the devil. Annabelle Thompson even admitted that she had made a deal with the devil for a better life. She had been widowed twice, and so she turned to the devil for help, and in return she would be loyal to him. She then invited the other women to come over and do all these things with the devil with her. Her. The women then apparently formed a demonic pact with each other and Satan. One of the Margaret Hamiltons also admitted that she had met the devil. She claimed that the devil came to her in the form of a black dog. And she said that she was his servant for three decades already. And another was accused of using her witch magic to help get wealth. As a result, all the witches were found guilty and were strangled at the stake before being burned to ashes. Number five, did rye bread cause the witch hunts? According to my research, this is apparently the most common bizarre myth in all of Salem. So ergot is a fungus blight that forms hallucinogenic, um, fun stuff in bread, causing its victims to appear bewitched when actually they're just higher than a kite. The victims of ergot might suffer paranoia and hallucinations, twitches and spasms, cardiovascular trouble, and, um, stillborn stuff. This particular fungus thrives in a cold winter followed by a wet spring and seriously weakens the immune system. Human poisoning due to the consumption of rye bread made from ergot infected grain was actually pretty common in Europe back in the Dark Ages. The first mention of a plague of gangrenous ergotism in Europe comes from Germany back in 857, and following this, France and Scandinavia experienced similar outbreaks. England is notably absent from the historical regions affected by ergotism since its main source of food was wheat, which is resistant to ergot fungi. Back in 944, a massive outbreak of ergotism caused 40,000 deaths in the regions of Aquitaine, Limousin, Perigode, and Angoumois in France. The theory of ergot poisoning is that it grew on the rye that the colonists of Salem used to make their bread. The ergot would have had that uh, LSD-like effect that caused the inhabitants to see and hear things that weren't there, thus causing the bizarre hallucinations, which caused over 250 people to be accused of witchcraft. The origins of this legend started in 1976 when Linda R. Caporial wrote a paper entitled Ergotism, The Satan Loosed in Salem. It was publicly dismissed by Stephen Nissenbaum, a historian and co-author of Salem Possessed, and over the years dozens of experts have weighed in and found the basis for this theory lacking in anything resembling convincing. For starters, at the time the custom was for all bread to be served toasted, as Puritans generally believed that untoasted bread caused stomach problems, which would have helped to kill off any ergot that survived baking. Also, one of the most common side effects besides hallucinations was gangrene and necrotism of the um, extremities. If this was happening during a time when every single instance of perceived witchcraft was being documented and dozens of people were so affected by this, you know, ergot poisoning that they were having hallucinations, someone would have documented that, you know, the other symptoms were happening as well. And to my knowledge, the other symptoms weren't as common.
Number four, the ghost of Sheriff George Corwin. So while I've done my best to try and leave the witches themselves off of today's list, since I did promise y'all legends that weren't the trials, you might have picked up by now that most of the legends revolve around the history of the trials in one way or another. There's no escaping it, so make sure you're still buckled up and enjoy. Sheriff Corwin was the most infamous and brutal when it came to interrogating and handling accused witches back in the day, earning himself a nickname for his heinous methods of torment. Oh, you want to know what the nickname was? Well, sadly, I'm not allowed to say it thanks to interweb rules, but it involved uh, hands around necks and lack of air. A building called the Joshua Ward House now stands on top of the land where George lived and died, and many people say that they've seen him in the windows or even felt his hands pressing down around their necks when they're inside the space. In terms of lineage, he was the nephew of Witchcraft Trials Judge and Witch House owner Jonathan Corwin. He's most famously known for the case of Giles Corey, who endured peine forte et dure, or a pressing of stones upon his chest for three days, while Sheriff Corwin repeatedly asked him to enter an official plea before his god and country, which Corey had refused to do so in court. According to the legend, George was so sadistic and enjoyed tormenting folks so much that he had a secret dungeon below his home, where he could carry out his fiendish desires whenever he wished. Now that we have the legend part of this out of the way, time to consult the history books for the factual side of things. The actual cases of George tormenting the accused are documented, but are far fewer than have actually been attributed to him. In the case of Giles Corey, who had pleaded innocent but refused to use the official phrasing, likely to delay proceedings and cause trouble for the court and judges that he was furious with, his punishment was technically illegal by the original Massachusetts law. The Body of Liberties Act of 1641 forbade extreme harm, and while the Body of Liberties was officially replaced by the Provincial Charter in 1691, aka the year of the witchcraft hysteria began, it was still very much upheld in spirit during this time, and George performing these acts was not seen as appropriate, it may have even led to Governor Phipps, you know, paying more attention to the trials and to disband the court of Oyer and Terminer that he himself had set up. Also, if he had actually had his own like personal dungeon for illegal bad things, there would have had to have been multiple cover-ups, and there isn't really proof of that during a time when everything was documented. At the end of the day, there isn't proof he did, or didn't, so let me know in the comments where you stand on this. In the middle of this scary sandwich, we have Angèle de la Barthe in third place. Born around 1230 in Toulouse, France, she was a noble woman and a Gnostic Christian, which was a sect that was considered heretical by the Catholic Church. By definition, Gnostic Christian is a term that refers to various branches of early Christianity that claim to have special divine knowledge. They have different views of the Bible, Jesus Christ, salvation, and God compared to traditional Catholics. They have diverse teachings and practices such as volunteer Tinaism, Sethianism, Manichaeism, and Mandaeism. Some of them regard Jesus as a human being who became enlightened or Christed, while others see him as a divine being who came to lead humanity back to the light. In 1275, Angèle was accused of having sexual relations with Satan and she was impregnated by him, giving birth to a baby that had the head of a wolf and a serpent's tail. This being consumed human flesh and Angèle stole infants to feed it. When she was arrested, she was tortured eventually confessed that the accusations were true. She was sentenced to death and burned alive, making her the first in Europe to have her life ended from accusations of witchcraft. Also, a uh, fun fact for you, at the time it wasn't illegal to have sexual relations with demons. If you have access to a time machine out there, don't get any ideas. In second place, Walpurgna Hosmanen was a midwife, born sometime between 1510 to 1527, where she lived and worked in Bavaria. Her trial was one of the most ruthless witch trials in Germany. Walpurgna's life had been unremarkable until her arrest on charges of witchcraft, sorcery, and vampirism in the year 1587. After her arrest, she was subjected to terrible torture go figure, until she confessed to her deeds. According to her confession, soon after she became widowed in 1556, when she was working in the field of the city, she had made arrangements to meet a male co-worker for sex in her cottage later that evening. But he had not arrived. Instead, a demon had come dressed in his clothes. She established a relationship with said demon, named Fiederlin, who made her swear allegiance to the devil and promised to rid her of poverty. Hey, sounds pretty tempting. During her confession, she stated that she had sworn herself to Satan and written it on a contract, and Fiederlin had then taken her to the real devil and confirmed her contract. After after which they had drunk wine, consumed the roasted flesh of young humans, and had sex. And uh, in case I need to clarify, she had intercourse with Federlin, not the devil. Uh, plot twist, I know. She described visiting the devil often, and her demon lover had also visited her plenty to have sex with her, even in the streets at night and while she was in prison, leaving every time she said the name of Jesus. All right, well, that's one way to come down from it. Federlin had gifted her the magical ointment she used to harm her victims, which included humans of a variety of ages, animals, and even crops. She confessed to having ended the life of many young during her work as a midwife by applying the special salve or putting pressure to their foreheads and to have sucked their blood like a vampire. Well, 
Perga also confessed to having eaten the young with other witches and using their hair for sorcery. The full list of crimes she confessed to was very long, with her victims including 41 young humans, two mothers in labor, and a multitude of other people and animals, including cows, pigs, geese, and a horse. The decision of authorities was swift and unanimous, with the church and royal court finding her guilty and sentencing her to death. Before being burned, she was first taken through the city and stopped five times before reaching the place of execution. At the first stop, they branded her left breast and right arm with irons, then her right breast at the second stop, her left arm at the third, with her left hand being then branded at the fourth stop. Once they reached the place of execution, her right hand, with which she had made her oath as a midwife, was uh, cut off before finally being burned alive at the stake. Her ashes were not allowed to remain on soil, but were then dumped in a stream. In first place, we have Gilles Garnier. I swear I don't intentionally plan to name male witches as the worst on my list, but they tend to commit the most heinous acts throughout history. And uh, before anyone wants to try to correct me in the comments again, men have often been named as witches throughout time. <laughs> Hey, continuing on, Gilles Garnier was a reclusive loner living in the woods around Dole, France. Despite being a solitary man, he got married in 1572. Historians have reported that Gilles was ill-equipped to provide for his family because he wasn't a very good hunter, being used to only having to provide for himself until that point. That's when he started hunting something else. Hey, anyone out there want to guess? Come on, I bet you can. All right, I'll give it to you. Human flesh. The first hunt happened around September 29th of 1572, when Garnier killed a young woman, allegedly well in the form of a wolf, and brought some of the flesh home for his wife to eat. How, uh, thoughtful? Throughout the autumn, more young humans were found unalived and mutilated, including another young woman that Giles bit and clawed at, but was interrupted by passerbys before fleeing. The girl sadly has succumbed to her injuries a few days later. In November, Jules ended the life of a young man this time, enjoying the flesh from his thighs and belly before tearing off a leg to save for later. I could be more, but um, I'm feeling a little queasy as it is. This caused a stir amongst the townspeople, who believed it was a werewolf who was committing the horrors. Many folks had witnessed a humanoid looking wolf near the scenes of the crimes, with the animal darting off once it was aware of being seen. Then in January of 1573, there was one last death. This time, villagers heard a child screaming and the sounds of a wolf, witnessing the wolf attempt to flee the scene, but changing into the form of Jules as it did. He was then arrested, put on the rack, and confessed to killing the young and consuming their flesh. At his trial, more than 50 people testified, and he was found guilty of lycanthropy, the ability to turn into an animal, and uh, witchcraft. He and his wife were burned at the stake on January 8, 1573. In fifth place, we have witch cakes to kick us off. Sadly, these aren't yummy Halloween cakes, a thought which makes me very hungry. <laughs> but instead a bizarre form of counter magic, a supernatural dessert used to identify suspected evildoers. In cases of mysterious illness or possession, witch hunters would take a sample of the victim's urine, mix it with rye meal and ashes, and bake it into a cake. This stomach-turning concoction was then fed to a familiar or animal helper of the suspected witch in the hopes that the creature would fall under its spell and reveal the name of the guilty sorcerer. During the hysteria that preceded the Salem witch trials, Tichuba famously helped prepare a witch cake to identify the person responsible for bewitching young Betty Paris and others. The brew failed to work, and Tichuba's knowledge of spells and fulcrum was later used as evidence against her when she was accused of being a witch. Before I forget, another use for a witch cake came from burning the pastry in hopes that the scorching heat would transfer to the witch and force her to reveal herself. Whew. Anybody else starting to get warm? Oh great, just me. In fourth place, we have a scold bridle. Also known as a witch's bridle, a gossip's bridle, a brink's bridle, or simply brinks, this was an instrument of punishment as a form of public humiliation. This thing was an iron muzzle in an iron framework that enclosed the head. Some exceptions were masks that depicted suffering, but not pleasant either way. My brain just jumped to a similar modern device used for pleasure instead of pain, and no, I will not elaborate on that thought, but Let's clarify. A bridle bit or curb plate around five centimeters by two and a half centimeters in size was slid into the mouth and pressed down on top of the tongue, often with a spike on the tongue as a compress. It functioned to silence the wearer from speaking entirely and caused extreme pain and physiological trauma to scare and intimidate the wearer into submission. This prevented speaking and resulted in many unpleasant side effects for the wearer, including excessive salivation and fatigue in the mouth. Seeing as I've always been a chatty Cathy, I can totally see how I would have been sentenced to this, and my jaw hurts just thinking about it. The wearer was then led around the town by a leash, and for extra humiliation, a bell could also be attached to um, draw in crowds. First recorded in Scotland in 1567, the pranks were also used in England and its colonies. The Kirk Sessions in Barony Courts in Scotland inflicted the contraption mostly on female transgressors, and women considered to be rude, 
nags, common scolds, drunken, but mostly witches. It was also used as corporal punishment for other offenses, notably on female workhouse inmates. A person to be punished was placed in a public place for additional humiliation and sometimes beaten. Just sometimes, not every time apparently. Knowing what I know about history and cover ups, I'm going to lean towards probably most of the time. The Lanark Berg records record a typical example of the punishment being used. When wearing the device, it was, yep, impossible for the person to either eat or speak. Other pranks included an adjustable gag with a sharp edge, causing any movement of the mouth to result in laceration of the tongue. In Scotland, pranks could also be permanently displayed in public by attaching them, for example, to the town cross, tron, or toll booth. Then the ritual humiliation would take place, with the miscreant on public display. Displaying the pranks in public was intended to remind the populace of the consequences of any rash action or slander. Whether the person was paraded or simply taken to the point of punishment, the process of humiliation and expected repentance was the same. Time spent in the brittle was normally allocated by the Kirk Session, in Scotland or by a local magistrate. Number three, tunnels under the graveyard. Honest to goodness, the moment I heard about this as a possibility, my modern brain started to think about all the ways this could be convenient today. Also, being a Disney girl, my brain did jump to the utilidor system that runs under Disney World. Ooh, and the Toronto Path. Granted, I never really use it unless my dad's visiting and we're like walking around downtown or if I'm trying to get to Union Station after a convention downtown. Pardon me, I know, off topic. So this legend claims that underneath the old Bearing Point Cemetery is a series of tunnels that used to be connected to the Salem Harbor. Used for smuggling or simply unloading ships, these tunnels would flood with a high tide. When digging graves, workers would simply open up shafts to these tunnels, and as the priests would ask the mourners to look up to the heavens, they would unceremoniously dump the bodies down these shafts to be washed out to sea. It sounds a smidge morbid and hard to believe, but that's the joy of legends. But here's the thing, it actually has like the tiniest glimmer of truth, like the tiniest, most minuscule flicker. Small than Tinkerbell. Originally, the Salem Harbor did come close to what is currently the cemetery, until sections of the city were filled in, and there are some tunnels underneath Salem. However, the rest is such complete and utter ridiculousness that historians are adamant it isn't true. But there's only one way to find out. Who wants to go on a road trip to Salem with me to go tunnel hunting? My car has room for plenty of people, trust me. Number two, the bodies under the witch house. So remember when I mentioned Jonathan Corwin just a few moments ago? Yeah, that's about to come into play again. So when the Corwin house, AKA Jonathan's house, was moved back in the 1940s to accommodate the widening of the street, underneath the original hearth were several bones. These were thought to be hidden bodies and the town was in an uproar over the hidden corpses in the basement of the witch house. And if we're going off of information based on the legend, it would make sense with the whole secret dungeon of George's. This legend actually has the most historical fact behind it, as there was indeed a newspaper article about bones found under the witch house, along with a shocking headline and gruesome photo to accompany it. Sadly, or well, I guess not sadly for humans, just sadly for the purpose of sensationalism, the reality behind that headline is a little more mundane. It was common at the time of building said house, you know, around the 1640s, to bury meat or bones underneath the cooking hearth in order to promote plentiful food for its inhabitants. Even if this wasn't the case, since I know we all like to poke holes into thin theories, the odds of charred bones from various meals over the past 300 years, finding their way into the ashes and under added bricks isn't really unlikely. And regardless of their origin, the bones discovered were decidedly not human. Apparently a whole boatload of tests were done. So sadly, unlike the Disney urban legend where we found out that there really are human boats on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, this one might be bunk. As a side note to this entry, there are no official cases of witchcraft trial victims being brought to the Corwin house for examination. While Corwin may have heard original accusations in his parlor, the odds of him being willing to bring an accused witch into his home with his family and descendants are astronomically are astronomically against it. Dang it all though, I like when my theories are right. Number one, the Seven Gables Secret Stairs. The House of the Seven Gables, which is also known as the Turner House or Turner Ingersoll Mansion, is a 1668 colonial mansion in Salem, Massachusetts, named for its gables. It was made famous by Nathaniel Hawthorne's 1851 novel, The House of the Seven Gables, and is now a non-profit museum. The earliest section of the House of the Seven Gables was built in 1668 for Captain John Turner, and remained in his family for three generations, descending from John Turner II to John Turner III. You get the idea. Facing south towards Salem Harbor, it was originally a two-room, two-and-a-half-story house with a projecting front porch and a massive central chimney, but nowadays that portion forms the middle of the house. Four windows of the original ground room floor, which became a dining room, remain in the house's side wall, and a few years after the original build, a kitchen lean-to and a new north kitchen L to the rear of the house were added. By 1676, Captain Turner had added a spacious front extension with its own chimney, containing a parlor on the ground floor with a large bedchamber above it. 
Ceilings in this new wing are higher than the very low ceilings in older parts of the house, and it featured double basement windows and an overhang with carved pendants. It was all capped with a three-gabled garret. In the first half of the 18th century, John Turner II remodeled the house in the new Georgian style, adding wood paneling and sash windows. These alterations are preserved as very early examples of Georgian decor. The House of the Seven Gables is one of the oldest surviving timber-framed mansion houses in continental North America, with 17 rooms and over 8,000 square feet, including its large cellars. So for as long as people have been giving and taking tours of the House of the Seven Gables, the story has gone that the secret staircase of the house was used for just about everything, from smuggling freed slaves through the Underground Railroad road to hiding secret lovers for midnight trysts. Sadly, it's just a set of servant stairs. So back when servants were in common usage, these stairs and passages were just as common, since it was considered unseemly for the servants to be in public view. They were meant to be invisible, spiriting into rooms to make them tidy without anybody noticing them. Ergo, hidden stairs and passageways were built to make it easy for them to access areas without meeting the gentry in the main halls and stairs. They're pretty common in older grand places. Uh, locations like Casa Loma jumped to mind for me since they have one behind like a fireplace or something, if my memory's correct. Apparently in recent years there has been some debate over whether the staircase would have been part of the original or later period structure, as it was part of a rebuild by a famous colonial revivalist architect by the name of Joseph Chandler at the direction of Caroline Emerton in 1909. It absolutely fits with the design of servant stairs though that are seen in many similar structures. And gosh dang, here I was hoping for another home on the same level of spooky as the Winchester Mystery House over in California. Now that's a home with the most random additions with no meaning, all meant to hopefully appease spirits. Funny enough, I think an acquaintance of mine is working there as a scare actor this year. It's a good reminder to touch base with them. Starting off at number five, burning at the stake. By far the most well known punishment for those tried as witches, burning at the stake was a cruel and unusual form of execution used commonly back during the many witch trials of the 17th century. These executions were not only physically agonizing, but also symbolized the depths of human fear and prejudice. One such example of this terrible practice was the Würzburg witch trials of the 17th century, known as one of the largest witch trials in history. Accused witches faced a horrifying fate at the stake. The authorities believed that fire possessed the purifying power to cleanse the accused of their alleged connections to the devil. In reality, it was a grotesque display of violence. Victims were often tied to wooden stakes in a public square, surrounded by jeering crowds. They were subjected to unimaginable pain as the flames slowly consumed them. The agony of being burnt alive was drawn out, excruciating, and inhumane. What made the burning of witches particularly cruel was the complete absence of credible evidence. The trials were fueled by paranoia, superstition, and hysteria. Accusations were often based on flimsy hearsay, personal grudges, or even just random suspicions. The accused had little chance to defend themselves, and confessions were often extracted through rigorous mental and physical torment. These false confessions only added to the tragedy, as innocent people were forced to implicate themselves and others in a desperate attempt to end their suffering. Furthermore, the persecution of witches during the Wurzburg witch trials, like many other witch hunts, was often intertwined with gender bias. Women, especially those who didn't conform to societal norms, were disproportionately targeted. Accusations of witchcraft could be used to control and punish women who challenged the status quo or were perceived as a threat to male authority. The cruelty of burning witches at the stake was not limited to the physical torment. It was a gruesome spectacle, intended to terrify the populace into submission. Public executions were meant to send a message that dissent would not be tolerated and that conformity to prevailing religious and social norms was imperative. The psychological impact on society was profound, as fear and mistrust tore communities apart. The Wurzburg witch trials, like many others, were eventually recognized as a dark chapter in history. They serve as a stark reminder of the dangers of mass hysteria, religious fantasism, and the absence of due process. Today we look back on these events with horror and regret, vowing never to repeat the cruelty of burning alleged witches at the stake. It is a somber lesson that underscores the importance importance of justice, reason, and compassion in our pursuit of a more enlightened society. Next up at number 4, Witch Cakes. Witch Cakes are a bizarre and unsettling aspect of the witch trials that swept through colonial America during the 17th century, as exemplified in the infamous case of Tichuba. These cakes, concocted from peculiar ingredients, were believed to possess the power to reveal the presence of witches. While they may seem like a bizarre footnote in history, witch cakes serve as a chilling reminder of the hysteria and irrationality that fueled the witch trials. In the case of Tichuba, a slave woman living in Salem, Massachusetts, witch cakes played a central 
pivotal role in her ordeal. Tichuba was accused of practicing witchcraft, and her accuser sought a means to expose her supposed demonic affiliations. They decided to bake a witch cake, a crude mixture of rye meal and the urine of the afflicted girls who claimed to be victims of witchcraft. Ew. The logic behind these cakes was deeply flawed and rooted in superstition. It was believed that by feeding the cake to a dog, the dog would act as a conduit, causing the witch to experience pain and reveal their true nature. This bizarre form of witch detection demonstrates the length of which fear and paranoia can drive people to concoct irrational and cruel methods of persecution. Tichuba was subjected to this ordeal, and when the dog exhibited unusual behavior, you know, because it was eating urine, it was seen as evidence of her guilt. This marked the beginning of her traumatic journey through the Salem witch trials, which ultimately led to her confession under duress. The use of witch cakes underscores the hysteria and desperation that characterized the witch trials. Accusers and authorities were willing to resort to absurd and unscientific methods to justify their persecution of those they believed to be witches. These methods were not only illogical, but also cruel, as they subjected the accused to public humiliation, physical examinations, and often torment. In third place we have a ducking chair, not to be confused with a cucking chair, which is a whole other concept, or the red hot stools woman accused of having sexual acts with the devil would have to sit on. I sadly don't have enough information to unpack that stool, other than ouch. But um, let's get on with the ducking, shall we? The ducking stool was a strongly made wooden armchair, often made out of oak, in which the offender was seated, with an iron band being placed around them so that they would uh, not fall out during their immersion. How Thorough. The earliest record of the use of such is towards the beginning of the 17th century, with the term first being attested in English in 1597. It was used both in Europe and in the English colonies of North America. Usually the chair was fastened to a long wooden beam fixed as like a seesaw on the edge of a pond or river. And as much as I love and miss wooden playgrounds, I feel like this might not have been as fun. Sometimes the ducking stool was not a fixture, but was mounted on a pair of wooden wheels so that it could be wheeled through the streets, and at the river edge was hung by a chain from the end of a beam. And Sentencing a woman, the magistrates ordered the number of ducking she should have, and as much as I've scared with the internet, I can't seem to find number data on this. If you have any ideas, please let me know in the comments. Another type of ducking stool was called a tumbrel, and was a chair on two wheels with two long shafts fixed to the axles. This was pushed into the pond, and then the shafts would be released, ergo tipping the chair up backwards. Sometimes the punishment proved fatal, and the subject died. Once again, the um sometimes, should be taken with a pound of salt. In medieval times until the early 18th century, ducking was a way used to establish whether a suspect was a witch. The ducking stools were first used for this purpose, but ducking was later inflicted without the chair. In this instance, the subject's right thumb was bound to her left big toe, her left thumb to her right big toe, a rope was tied around the waist of the accused, and she was thrown into a river or a deep pond. If she floated, it was deemed that she was in league with the devil, rejecting the baptismal water. If she sank, she was cleared. Oh, and she'd be dead. Can't forget that part. Silly me. In second place, we have witch mark hunting and pricking. Witch hunters often had their suspects stripped and publicly examined for signs of an unsightly blemish that witches were said to receive upon making their pact with Satan. This devil's mark had supposedly changed shape and color and was believed to be numb and insensitive to pain. Prosecutors might also search for the witch's teat, which was an extra nipple allegedly used to suckle the witch's helper animals. In both cases, it was really easy for even the most minor physical imperfections to be labeled as the work of the devil himself. Oh my, the horror. Moles, scars, birthmarks, sores, and tattoos could all qualify. So examiners really came up empty handed. I'm trying to think of just how many birthmarks I have all over my body. So just add that to the tally of how I'm, you know, a witch. Seriously, I feel the burning from the flames already. In the midst of witch hunts, desperate villagers would sometimes even burn or cut off any offending marks on their bodies, only to have their wounds labeled as proof of a covenant with the devil. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. If I'm adding like scars to my blemish count, yeah, forget it. Okay, I think the temperature in here just went up another couple of degrees. Seriously. If witch hunters struggled to find obvious evidence of witch's marks on a suspect's body, they might resort to the ghastly practice of pricking as a means of, you know, sussing it out. Come on! Even having a flawless body isn't going to exonerate you? What the heck? Witch hunting books and instructional pamphlets noted that the marks were insensitive to pain and couldn't bleed, so examiners used specially designed needles to repeatedly stab and prick at the accused person's flesh until they discovered a spot that produced the desired results. In England and Scotland, the punishment was eventually performed by well-paid professional prickers, many of whom were actually con men who used dull needle points to identify fake witch's marks. 
Well then, if you ever feel like your job just you know isn't real, remember that people in history were paid to do well. Along with pricking, the unfortunate suspect might also be subjected to scratching by their supposed victims. This test was based on the notion that possessed people found relief by scratching the person responsible with their fingernails until they um, drew fluid. If their symptoms improved after clawing at the accused skin, it was seen as partial evidence of guilt. No, no, absolutely not. I can't see anyone being proven innocent whatsoever from this nonsense. Talk about a biased court. In first place, we have dismemberment and mutilation. This is where my own stomach gets all topsy turvy, so fair warning. I can handle creepy stuff, no problem. But gore? There is a reason I haven't been able to bring myself to watch the Terror Bar movies. So, when witch hunters wanted to get answers back in the day, if I haven't made it clear enough by now, they didn't really care about being humane or, you know, coercion, just being right. They would do whatever they deemed necessary to get a confession, leading many witches to confess just to make the pain stop and end their lives, well, Humanely, say goodbye to your fingernails because that was practically just a footnote in what they were allowed to do. While Perga Hosmanin of Bavaria was led through multiple different stages of mutilation while being paraded to her execution. At the first stop, her left breast and right arm were branded with irons, then her right breast at the second stop, her left arm at the third, with her left hand being then branded at the fourth stop. Once they reached the place of execution, her right hand, with uh, which she had made her oath as a midwife, was cut off before she was finally burned alive at the stake. Oh, her ashes were not allowed to remain on soil but they were just, you know, dumped in a stream. Probably the most extreme extent of this was a punishment normally reserved for killers, but exceptions were made for witches who confessed without torture to crimes deemed brutal enough for it. Are y'all ready for this? The offender would be strapped to four horses, with one arm or leg attached to each separate horse, and then on command, the horses would start running and rip the offender's arms and legs off. The person would die somehow, and painfully through life source and uh, limb loss. Starting off this countdown, we have John Reed. John Reed was one of the seven witches tried in 1690. Scotland. When he was caught, persecutors found that he had a mark on his loin. John said that the devil had nipped him there and that it indeed was a witch's mark. John also confessed that he was in service with the devil. The devil promised him wealth and abundance, but in return, John belonged to the devil. But John revealed that the devil broke his promise and never did anything he said he was going to do. On top of that, John admitted to attending a number of meetings with other witches. He also admitted that he was responsible for the torment of Christian. Shaw. Christian was an 11 year old who claimed she encountered a pack of witches who then bullied her and stole her milk. He also admitted that they all drowned her in the local well. As a result of his confession, it was very clear that he was a witch and he was locked away in a cell. The next day though, he was found dead. He had hung himself in his cell with his own scarf. It was believed that this was the devil's work. The devil convinced him to take his own life because John exposed him. Within the following weeks, the other witches close to John took their own lives in their cell as well. Again, it's thought that the devil possessed them and killed them off one by one because he was pissed with them. In our fourth spot, we have Janet Howitt. Between between 1661 to 1663, 44 people in Fofor, Scotland were accused of witchcraft. Seven of those accused were executed. The fate of some of the others remain unclear. One of the main women was Helen Guthrie. She was not a nice lady at all. This woman murdered her own stepsister and the stepsister's children. But she was like, wait, 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 I'll help you, and claimed that she was able to identify other witches just by looking at them. So she said she would help them in the witch hunt if they went easy on her. She then went on to make up elaborate stories of witches meeting up at graves and eating the flesh of other humans, etc. The more she made up and pointed fingers, the longer she got to live. And same with her daughter, Janet Howitt. Janet was also accused of being a witch like her mom. In fact, she had a witch's mark on her shoulder. She said it was from the devil biting it. She also said that it hurt for so long until the devil visited her again and stroked her shoulder. When he did that, the pain immediately stopped. Now, Janet was imprisoned with the rest of the accused, but we don't know what happened to her. They held a trial for her and no one testified against her. Plus, they only had the mark on her shoulder as evidence. We truly don't know if young Janet was let go or sadly killed. What we do know is that her plea date was 1666, four years after her arrest. So she was in jail for quite some time. Number three, dunking. Dunking was a cruel and unusual punishment employed during the witch trials that swept through Europe and its colonies in the 16th and 17th centuries, including Northamptonshire, England. 
This brutal practice, also known as ducking or swimming, was intended to determine an individual's guilt or innocence of witchcraft, but it often resulted in severe physical and psychological suffering. In Northamptonshire and other regions, dunking involved binding the accused witch, often a woman, and lowering her into a body of water, typically a river or pond. The rationale behind this test was rooted in superstition and flawed logic. It was believed that because witches had renounced their baptism, the pure element of water would reject them causing them to float. If the accused floated, they were seen as guilty of witchcraft. If they sank, they were deemed innocent, but often drowned in the process. Being forcibly dunked into cold water while bound was a terrifying and painful experience. The accused would struggle for air and face the risk of drowning, all while the onlookers watched in morbid anticipation. Dunking was an arbitrary and irrational method of determining guilt. The outcome depended on various factors, such as the accused body's composition and the skill of the dunking implement. Implementers. Innocent people could easily be declared guilty, leading to wrongful executions. Despite its cruelty and lack of reliability, dunking persisted in witch trials because it was consistent with the prevailing belief in the supernatural and the desire for swift justice. It was only with the eventual decline of witch hunts and the advent of more rational legal systems that such inhumane practices were abandoned. At number two, prayer tests. Prayer tests stand as the greatest example of the unjust nature of the witch trials and the persecution of innocent individuals, making it a cruel punishment for anyone put on trial. They were a controversial and often absurd method used during the witch trials to supposedly rule out witches. These tests were grounded in superstition and religious fervor rather than sound evidence. Two notable cases, those of Jane Wenham and George Burroughs, shed light on the use and cruel consequences of such prayer tests during witch trials. Jane Wenham's case is one of the last witch trials in England, occurring in 1712. She was accused of witchcraft in Hertfordshire, and her trial attracted considerable attention due to the changing climate of skepticism regarding witch trials. One of the methods employed to test her guilt or innocence was the prayer test. In Wenham's trial, the prayer test involved having the accused recite the Lord's Prayer without error usually out of the Bible or other holy texts. It was believed that a witch would be unable to utter the prayer correctly due to their alleged unholy nature. However, this test was deeply flawed and arbitrary, as it ignored the fact that many accused witches were uneducated and might struggle with reading the Lord's Prayer, especially in the intense and stressful environment of a trial. She also underwent dunking in order to test her witchy nature. Fortunately, Jane Wenham was found not guilty, thanks to the rising skepticism surrounding witchcraft. Even when accused of flying, the judge would retort, is flying a crime? Which it isn't. Her case is often cited as a turning point in England's witch trials, as it exposed the irrationality and injustice of such proceedings. But in the case of George Burroughs in 1692, he wasn't so lucky. George Burroughs was one of the individuals accused and executed during the Salem witch trials in colonial Massachusetts. His case highlights how the prayer test was used in the American context. In Burroughs' trial, the authorities used the Lord's Prayer as a test of his innocence. They believed that if he couldn't recite it correctly, he must be a which. Burroughs, to the astonishment of many, recited the prayer flawlessly, challenging the validity of the test. However, the court, fueled by hysteria and prejudice, dismissed this as a trick of the devil. So much for testing him, right? George Burroughs was ultimately convicted and hanged, illustrating how even when an accused individual passed the prayer test, it did not it did not guarantee their acquittal or protection from the witch hunt's irrationality. So yeah, if you were wanted dead back then, you would be made dead. And at number one, crushing. In the annals of history, the Salem Witch Trials of 1692 stand as a stark testament to humanity's capacity for cruelty, particularly in the realm of legal punishment. Amid the hysteria that gripped colonial Massachusetts, a plethora of cruel and unusual methods were employed to elicit confessions from the accused witches. Among these harrowing practices, the use of pressing or crushing remains one of the most chilling. The process of pressing was as brutal as it was inhumane. The accused individual would be stripped of all dignity and laid down in a dark, dank cell. Heavy stones or wooden boards, laden with an unimaginable weight, would then be stacked upon their chest. The agony that followed was beyond words. As the relentless pressure bore down, every grasp for breath became a desperate struggle. The rationale behind this method was chillingly simplistic. Those who confessed to their alleged dealings with the devil could halt the pressing, while those who resisted would face an excruciating demise. The authorities, consumed by fear and paranoia, believed that witches, having supposedly consorted with Satan, possessed a supernatural resilience that rendered them impervious to such torment. 
The cruelty of pressing was evident not only in its physical brutality, but also in its stark absence of due process. Accused witches had no chance to defend themselves, no legal representation, and no recourse to justice. Their fates rested in the hands of accusers and a court swayed by mass hysteria and irrational beliefs. Perhaps the most infamous case of pressing during the Salem witch trials was that of Giles Corey. A resilient and principled man, Corey refused to enter a plea, knowing that doing so would lead to the forfeiture of his property. His stoic resistance, in the face of a slow and agonizing death, made him a symbol of defiance against the unjust trials. Starting off this countdown, we have Tatuba. Tatuba is a pretty famous name when it comes to the Salem witch trials because she was the first woman to be accused of practicing witchcraft. So Tatuba was a young slave who was under the order of a man named Samuel Paris. She was in charge of looking after his daughter and niece, among other things. Then in the early 1690s, several young girls all over town began acting strange, his daughter and niece included. The girls would contort their bodies, bark like dogs, and babble and cry hysterically, almost as if they were possessed. They also would complain of bruises and pinch marks appearing randomly on their body. So immediately, people thought that they had been cursed by a witch. When she was put in front of a court, at first she denied any involvement. But eventually she admitted to practicing witchcraft. She claimed that the devil came to her and bid her to serve him. She went on to tell this elaborate tale about seeing strange animals, like a hairy creature that walked on two legs with wings and a head like a woman. She also talked about a red cat and how she would ride on sticks and was told by the devil to pinch these young girls. She also claimed that a big black dog came to her and told her to hurt the girls. Her testimony shocked and scared a lot of people. And we don't know if what she said was true or if she was just messing with the people in the court, you know, playing into the whole witch stereotype, or if she really was practicing witchcraft and made a deal with the devil. In the end, she was sent to prison for a year. In 1693, some mysterious unknown individual freed her from jail, and after that, no one heard from her. In our fourth spot today, we have Agnes Sampson. In the early 1590s, King James VI of Scotland started to fear witches. He blamed that witches could cast spells on Mother Nature and conjure up terrible storms. Well, as King James and his wife were sailing back to Scotland, they encountered two very dangerous storms. Immediately, he was like, it was the witches, they're out to get me. And then he was determined to get them. So he started a witch hunt. Of the 70 people accused of being witches, one of them was named Agnes Sampson. She was a healer and midwife, but because she had these healing powers, people automatically assumed that she was an evil witch. In fact, growing up, her father taught her about the black arts. She also apparently could give predictions. So yes, she was a witch, but she was not an evil one. Well, eventually she was accused by a woman named Gillis Duncan. Basically, under torture, she confessed to being a witch and then gave the names of other witches. That's when Samson's name was brought up. She was then tortured as well and her body was shaved and revealed a witch's mark. In the end, under torture, she confessed to being allies with Satan and said that she conspired to kill the king. She was later burned to death. Now it's said that the ghost of Agnes haunts the palace of Holy Roadhouse. A number of people have seen her roaming around naked after she was stripped and tortured. In our third spot, we have the Witches of Huntingdon. The Witches of Huntingdon were several individuals in the UK who were found guilty of witchcraft. First, we have Elizabeth Weed. Apparently one night, three spirits came to her and told her to renounce God and make a blood pact with the devil. So she listened and that's what she did. John Winnick also did the same, but only agreed to if the spirits would help him out financially. Others, including John Clark Jr., were also visited by these spirits and decided to also renounce God and make a deal with the devil. Out of the nine people accused, five were found guilty and hanged. Well, John Clark knew that they were going to search everyone's body for their witch's mark, which they all had. So what did he do? He cut off his three days before he was searched. Literally gouged it out of his skin so that the mark was gone. But I'm kind of confused because wouldn't that create another mark? 
I don't know. But I think he was let off the hook while he watched his friends be killed. He literally said, and I quote, It was foolish to let the authorities find their marks. I cut off mine three days before I was searched. He then denied ever making a pact with the devil or being a witch, even though he was. Moving on to number two, we have George Jacobs Sr. George Jacobs Sr. was an English colonist who was accused of witchcraft in 1692 during the Salem witch trials. George was quite the man around town. He had several run ins with the law. He was known for having a violent temper, and in 1677, hit a man named John Tompkins Jr. Two witnesses said, and I quote, One blow, and if the latter had not held him by the arms, he would have struck him some more, he being in such a passion. Now he was fine for this. Then in 1674, he was sued by his neighbor after he chased some of his horses into the river where they drowned. He argued that the horses were trespassing on his property, whereas others thought he just liked wreaking havoc on town. Fast forward several years later, George Jacobs Sr. and his son, George Jacobs Jr., and his daughter in law and granddaughter were all accused of witchcraft. Everyone got off except for Jacobs Sr., and that's because he had a witch's mark. His body was searched and they found what was described as three teats on Jacobs. It was thought that if a person had an extra nipple, that this was a sign that they were a witch. Why? Well, it was believed that the extra nipple or teat was from when the devil or some demons sucked the witch's blood as a form of nourishment. It was said that Jacob Sr. had three of them. One in his mouth, one on his right shoulder blade, and one on his hip. Now, they weren't actually nipples though, it was just a quarter inch long fleshy thing protruding from his skin with a sharp point. They proceeded to stick pins in each of them to see what would happen. This was called the witch pricker. Apparently, if you are pricked and you don't have a reaction to getting pricked and you don't bleed, then you are a witch. Well, when they pricked each teeth, Jacobs never reacted to it and he didn't even bleed. So he was found guilty in August 5th, 1692 and was sentenced to be hanged along with the other witches. And in our number one spot we have Elspeth Rioch. Elspeth Rioch was an alleged witch in Scotland during the early 1600s. When she was 12 years old, she claimed that she was approached by two men. One was dressed in all black, the other in green tartan. The man in green told her that if she followed his instructions, that she would be able to obtain magical powers. He told her to boil an egg and use the condensation from cooking the egg and take it and rub it on her eyes with unwashed hands. Sounds like an eye infection to me. He said that this would give her the powers to see and know everything that she wanted. So she followed his instructions and bam, it actually worked. So now I kind of want to go home and try it. I don't know, maybe it will work. And she actually developed clairvoyant skills. When Elspeth was older, she was visited again by the men. This time it was only the man in black. He showed up in her room one night. He told her that he was neither dead nor alive, but trapped between heaven and earth. He also told her that to maintain her magic skills, she needed to act dumb. That way, no one would suspect a thing. They'd be like, she's not a witch. No, she's way too dumb to be one. Well, eventually she was caught. In fact, she got in way more trouble because of her acting dumb. They were all like, she's fully a witch. She tried to trick us. Let's kill her. At her trial in March of 1616, she confessed to using her clairvoyant powers to spy on people, and she would also use magical spells to cure illnesses. Furthermore, when they inspected her body, they found a witch's mark. She had what appeared to be a scar in the shape of bite marks on her shoulder. Later, she confessed that she was bit by the devil and that was the mark that he left. She was charged with witchcraft and deceiving locals by pretending she was mute. In the end, she was executed by strangulation before having her body burned. Number 5. Julie Brown Our first witch today on the list of which witch is which is Julie Brown, legendary voodoo priestess of the swamps. New Orleans is filled to bursting with two things, the most wondrous advancements in soul food and gumbo technology on the planet, and ghost stories. There's a whole lot of voodoo to go around in Louisiana, and in Manchac they say there's the ghost of an old voodoo priestess named Julie Brown. The story of Julie Brown is an unnerving one. I would certainly hope so, otherwise it wouldn't be on this list. She was said to be reclusive, would sit on the porch of her swamp shack and spend the day cackling, predicting the demise of nearby towns and its residents, singing twisted songs about 
her death and the apocalypse and the end of days. Despite the fact that she was a kooky old lady singing songs about the apocalypse on her front steps, locals actually feared her and treated her as an oracle and a prophet and were very nervous of wronging her just in case she placed a hex on them, which, you know, is reasonable. You should always treat everyone you meet with kindness just in case they turn out to be a witch who can hex you. The prediction she's most known for, besides one bizarre correct prediction about the 1994 Super Bowl Cowboys at Bills game, was her threatening prediction in 1915, where Julie Brown would cackle over and over and over that she was going to die and take everyone with her. She chanted this again and again until her death. On her funeral, a hurricane hit the town, decimating three villages and taking countless lives. Julie is said to be buried in the swamp, and locals believe it was her spirit that caused the hurricane. And if you happen to be passing through Manchac, just pay your respects to Miss Julie Brown. Like I said, you never know what kind of secret somebody has. And if you're looking for more stories about witches or really any kind of urban legend, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. I'm not kidding. If you can think it up, there's pretty good odds we've done two to three videos on it. We got something scary for everything under the sun and above it. So hit subscribe. Please make sure you hit that little bell so you don't miss a single scream, but do that after this video because I got four more witch stories coming up for you right now. And wouldn't you know it, the next one's about a bell. Number four, the Bell Witch. In the 1800s, a farmer going by the name of John Bell moved his family to picturesque Adams, Tennessee, onto a beautiful 300 acre farm, little slice of American pie. Bell quickly became a figurehead of the community, respected by many, and became a local leader at the town church. For the Bell family, things were the brightest they've ever been. They were living the dream and ringing in good fortune. I was trying to make a Bell pun work there. There's probably a better one. Things wouldn't be good for long, and they'd find themselves in a nightmare shortly. By 1817, strange, inexplicable things started to occur all around the farmstead. John Bell found a strange animal on the farmstead, a mutant hybrid that resembled a grotesque mix between a dog and a rabbit. I know that sounds like it would be cute, but I think if you get the wrong parts of both, that's just gonna turn out to be a very, very ugly animal. I think dog, rabbit ears, pretty cute. Maybe like dog, rabbit face, dog, rabbit body. I don't know, mess. Anyway, it was a disgusting thing. The younger members of the Bell family would wake up covered in red scratches all over their bodies at all hours of the day. The family would hear faint whispering and singing that sounded like an old woman singing hymns. Most tragic is the Bells found a mysterious vial of liquid inside their home that no one could explain or understand. Nervous about what it was, the Bells offered the mystery liquid to their cat, which passed almost immediately. Rest in peace, Bell cat, taken too soon, undeservedly. You didn't deserve to be an experiment for them. For three long years, the Bell family was tormented by a mysterious entity that would later become known as the Bell Witch, after the mysterious old woman's humming and singing. In 1820, John Bell quickly grew extremely ill, quickly descending in his health, and would pass away later. At his funeral, the mourners complained they could all hear the laughing of an old woman mocking and singing the fate of the late John Bell. The farm became a haunted attraction, where it still is to this day, and it even caught the attention of President Andrew Jackson, who in 1819, a year before Mr. Bell's passing, visited to see if legends of the witch were real. Allegedly, allegedly. As soon as his carriage arrived at the property, the horses refused to budge anymore. The animals can always tell. Moving on to number three, we have Malin Matt's daughter. In July of 1676, Swedish widow Malin Matt's daughter was reported for being a witch. She was reported by her own daughters. They claimed that their mom would abduct a number of children and use them for a number of dark rituals. She was accused during the largest witch trial in Swedish history, the Great Noise. Now, was Malin actually a witch or were her daughters just looking to get rid of her? Well, sadly, we don't know for sure. She may have indeed been practicing witchcraft, but she wasn't going around abducting kids. That part was never proven. Anyways, when she was put in front of the court, she always maintained her innocence. Her partner, on the other hand, Anna Simon's daughter, Hack, was also accused of being a witch and apologized for her wrongdoings. These two women were the last victims executed for being witches. Anna was decapitated, but for Malin, well, they decided to burn her at the stake. 
She was the only witch in Swedish history to have been burned alive. Rumor has it that just before she was burned alive, she cursed both her daughters for eternity and gave them over to the devil. When the flames covered her body, apparently she did not scream, nor did she appear to be in pain. For everyone watching, this was further proof that she was in fact a witch. In our second spot today, we have Dion Fortune. Dion Fortune, born Violet Mary Firth, was a psychiatrist, author, occultist, and witch. For Fortune, it all started at the young age of four. That's when she claimed she started receiving visions. Apparently, the visions were of her being a priestess in her past life. Then, at the age of 20, she suffered a mental breakdown as a result of these psychic attacks, as she called them. During her recovery, she found herself drawn to the occult. From there, she began writing a number of books on the occult and witchcraft. In 1924, she founded a fraternity for people interested in the craft. It was called the Fraternity of Inner Light. In the fraternity, they engaged in a number of different practices and rituals. One was the initiation ritual, where the candidate was introduced to magic and witchcraft. The second was evocation, in which people would learn to harness the powers of witchcraft. Furthermore, Fortune was known for her involvement in the magical battle of Britain. Basically, a number of British occultists joined together to help during World War II by using their magic. Shortly after the war ended, Fortune passed away. It's believed that her great effort in this battle caused her health to weaken and weaken. Nowadays, her influence is still strong for practitioners in the Wicca slash witchcraft movement. And in our number one spot today, we have Marie Laveau. Although Marie Laveau described herself as a voodoo priestess, a number of people just refer to her as a witch. So Marie lived in New Orleans from 1794 to 1881, but not a lot is known about her life. What we do know is that she turned heads on the streets. Some were terrified of her, others basically bowed down to her. So it's said that the magic she practiced combined Catholic and African spiritual traditions. In fact, she was frequently called upon to help others. She would visit the sick in prisons, and at one point, the city called upon her for help with the yellow fever epidemic of the 1850s. On top of it all, she owned a large snake that she named Zombie, named after an African god. In fact, many believed that this snake harnessed magical powers itself. Her most well-known case was when she was called to work on a murder trial of a young man. The man's father came to Marie and promised her anything if she just saved his son. The odds were not in his favor. Everyone for sure thought that the verdict was going to be guilty. But Marie secretly placed several charms throughout the courtroom. And guess what? In the end, the man was found not guilty. That's pretty freaky. After Marie's death, her gravesite was frequently vandalized, but not for what you think. That's because legend goes if you draw an X on her gravestone, Marie's spirit will grant you whatever you want. So you have to draw an X on her tomb, then turn around three times, knock on her tomb, and then you have to yell out your wish. If in the end the wish comes true, you have to come back, circle the X, and then leave Marie an offering. Here's another legend surrounding Miss Laveau. There's apparently a haunted image of her hanging in New Orleans Historic Voodoo Museum. Some people say that they can feel Marie's cold eyes watching them as they're looking at this painting. Others say that once you see this image, then Marie will haunt you and even show up in your dreams. In fact, tour guides say that whoever wishes to see this painting must go by themselves because the tour guides refuse to see this painting themselves. It's pretty freaky if you ask me. Starting off this countdown, we have Julia Brown. Julia Brown was a well-known voodoo practitioner and witch in her small town in Louisiana. People knew her for her charms and her curses, as well as the creepy songs that she would sing on her porch with her guitar. In her community, people would come to her and she would perform a number of different rituals for them. That was until people started to take advantage of her, so she started to get back at them. When they came to her, she would scare them by telling them predictions like they're gonna die soon or bad things were coming for them. Then the locals were like, okay, hey, what's going on with her? Close to her death, Julia started to act strange. She would constantly sing songs about her death and how she would get revenge on the town. One song that she would sing goes as so, when I die, I take the whole town with me. When I die, I take the whole town. Not a very cheery and upbeat song if you ask me. In fact, no one knew what she was talking about until the day that she passed away. On September 29th, 1952, Julia passed away. 
On that day, the town came together for her funeral. Well, as they were lowering her casket into the ground, rain came down hard. This rain later turned into a disastrous hurricane that wiped out the entire town. So it's believed that before she left, she put a curse on the town, which is what she meant by when I die, I'm taking the whole town with me. Over the years, a number of people have attempted to rebuild the town, but every time they do, it ends up getting destroyed again. Maybe her curse is real then. In our fourth spot today, we have Gerald Gardner. Gerald Gardner is often called the father of modern witchcraft, and that's due to the fact that he founded Wicca. Although technically he learned it from a group of people and then went on to just write about it, so they gave him credit for it. But anyways, basically back in 1939, he said that one night he encountered a group of women who claimed to be witches. They stripped him of his clothes and put him in the middle of a ceremonial circle. The circle was lined with naked women and they showed him their ways. From there, he learned briefly about Wicca and thought, Hey, this is great, let's preserve this and make sure that everyone knows about it. In 1954, he actually created a book titled Witchcraft Today that teaches others how to embrace Wicca fully. He then went on and became obsessed with the occult. In fact, it's believed that a number of Wiccans and pagans were saved partly because of him. They could come out and be like, yeah, I'm a witch without fear of being hanged or burned alive. To this day, he's one of the most relevant witches in history, but also one of the more controversial ones. Number three, the black hag. Our next witch probably has the most impressive title out of any of them, the black hag. That is such a cool name for a witch to have. She resides in a church called, oh God. <sighs> Let me try this. The Monaster Nagal. Oh, what? You want to throw that on screen for me? Monaster Nag. How am I? How am I supposed to say that? This is the witch's curse. I don't even know about any witchy stuff she does. She tries to get you to say this evil word, and then it curses your family. I'm getting a note over here. It says that it's also called the Abbey of the Black Hag. Well, that's that's what we're going with. We're not calling it that other thing. I'm not doing that. The Black Abbey of the Hag, which as far as I know is the only name this church has ever gone by, was built in 1298. Wow, it's an old church. And was one of the few well-known medieval convents in old Ireland. The remains of the abbey still stand today in a secluded valley, making an already mysterious and supernatural place just that much more atmospheric. The place is called the Abbey of the Black Hag, for God's sakes. You don't name a place that unless it's pretty haunted. Sounds like it's straight out of Dishonored. And while I've got you here, Dishonored 3, when? When's that happening? Now, it's believed that the last abbess, which is a horrible word, in charge of the abbey practiced witchcraft, and in the scary way. She brought death, misfortune to the surrounding areas. Pope Martin V condemned the abbey. He was not down for witches at all. Catholic Church don't play with witches. The accused witch left to live out in the damp, deserted abbey by herself, which she probably loved because that sounds scary. Over time, her skin blackened, her hair furled, and her soul twisted, leading to the place being named the Abbey of the Black Hag. And if you can believe this, there's actually more to this story. The Count and Countess of Desmond once called the Abbey home when attempting to flee their attackers, where the Countess was fatally struck by an arrow and buried by her husband, but it would not be the end of the Countess. Sightings of a ghostly figure around the ruins of the Abbey were common, eventually leading to someone digging up worn out finger bones. And it's said now that a woman's panicked shrieking can be heard in the early hours around the Abbey. Number two, the Blair Witch. Perhaps one of the most pervasive witches in pop culture after the Wicked Witch of the West, the Scourge of Maryland, the Blair Witch. Perhaps you saw the very successful 1999 documentary regarding her legend, or maybe you saw one of the two middling sequels. According to legends, she haunts the Black Hills Forest near the town of Burkittsville, Maryland. The local folklore states that in the 18th century, a woman named Ellie Kedward was accused of practicing witchcraft. She was chased and exiled out of the township of Blair and condemned to live in the woods, hence the Blair Witch. It's believed that she died out in the surrounding forests in the harsh winter of 1785, but it's also said that she placed a curse on the town moments before her death, vowing to seek revenge on the townspeople and their descendants for generations. And not to split hairs here, but that does actually kind of sound like she was a witch. I'm not saying it was justified in exiling a woman out of her town, just that placing a hex on a town definitely sounds like witchcraft and I can understand where they were coming from. 
I'm just trying to understand the scenario, okay? I'm divorced from it. I'm not part of it. I'm just trying to understand it. From here, the legends of Kedward grew into the larger than life figure, the Blair Witch. Various disturbing events were attributed to the Blair Witch. Mysterious disappearances, people being lured away into the woods, supernatural phenomena, camera crews disappearing in forests, reports of finding strange hex bags in the surrounding woods filled with strange runes and symbols and remnants of people, hair, teeth, for her to perform wicked rituals. Now, it goes without saying, unless you firmly, firmly believe the marketing campaign of the 1999 film, the Blair Witch Project is obviously a movie. While they say it's based on the real story of Ellie Kenward, there is no record of a Blair Township ever having existed. Almost certainly, the Blair Witch's story is inspired in large swaths by the Bell Witch, who we talked about earlier. Although, in a kind of unique case, back in the day when the Blair Witch did come out, its marketing was so effective, and in this sort of like pre-early internet area, there were several people who did think it was real. It was a cast of completely unknown actors by a team no one had ever heard of. And on some level, I don't know, maybe to get esoteric with it, what makes an urban legend real? Just us believing in it, right? Do you believe the other four stories I've told you more? They're no less fictional. My only source was the internet for all of those. So, I'm just saying, open mind. Number one, La Bruja de Cachiche. And our final witch for today is going to be La Bruja de Cachiche, a well-known urban legend from Peru, specifically from the coastal town of Cachiche near the city of Ica. The legend revolves around a reputed witch who lived during the colonial era. According to legend, La Bruja de Cachiche was an enigmatic woman with exceptional powers and knowledge of witchcraft. She was believed to possess both healing abilities and the abilities to cast curses. She multi -specked. It was said that she used various herbs, potions, and rituals to perform her magic. Now, one of the most interesting aspects of this legend is this belief that La Bruja de Cachiche had a physical deformity, specifically a hunchback. And if there's one thing we love in an urban legend, it's a bit of a physical deformity. It makes it that much more believable and scary. Because someone conventionally unattractive is way scarier than not. Don't blame me. Blame our Western views on beauty. I didn't write them. I just perpetuate them. Over time, the legend of La Brahuda de Cachiche became intertwined with the history and culture of the town of Cachiche. Local residents and visitors began associating certain landmarks and natural phenomena with their presence. For example, there's a famous gnarled and twisted tree called the Witch's Tree that is said to have been her gathering place. Today, Cachiche has embraced the legend of La Brahuja de Cachiche as part of its heritage. The town has a statue of the witch and there are various festivals and events dedicated to her and I guarantee you no party goes even half as hard as a party celebrating a local witch. Oh my god, imagine the cauldrons do. The legend has also become a popular tourist attraction, drawing visitors who are interested in the occult Folklore and statues. Coming in at number five, the Corwin Witch House. The Jonathan Corwin House in Salem, or simply known better as the Witch House, was the home of Judge Jonathan Corwin, 1640 to 1718, a prominent figure in the horrors that happened there, and is actually the only structure you can visit in Salem today that has direct ties to the Salem Witch Trials of 1692. Well, that might not be the case, because we got a couple of those coming up. Trust me, this place is riddled with ties to those witches. Corwin bought the house in 1675 and lived there for more than 40 years. The witch house is a 350 year old thick building with black painted timber, two and a half stories tall, built to last, massive and looming. Located at 310 Essex Street in the historic district of Salem, the house stands in testimony to the witch trials and it's believed that the witch house was used by Jonathan Corwin and others to actually interrogate those accused of witchcraft. The witch house remained with the Corwins, of course, until the mid-1800s, yet there wasn't many family around to liven it up. The Corwin Curse seems like a weird one since all the Corwins' kids, five children, all perished young from separate complications within the house. And this is where it gets really weird. Not only is the place haunted to hell and back with specters seen in the attic upstairs and loud voices, arguments heard in the empty house at night, Eight Corwin lives were lost to premature death in that house. All Corwins. Yeah, I'd say that makes for a pretty cursed home, all right? A family curse. Number four, Proctor's Ledge. There are over a thousand documents from Salem witch trials, yet none of the accounts actually specify where the hangings took place. For many years, it was believed that the 19 people who were executed in Salem were hanged at the summit of Gallows Hill, 
on the edge of town to the west, where the town would meet for large gatherings. Seems like after some homework, the hill alone would be too hard to climb, not an ideal spot to hear or see the live trials, and was too thick and heavily wooded. Maps of 1700 Salem show Gallows Hill marked on the map, but no actual marker for the execution site. Hmm. I feel like a detective all of a sudden. A team of researchers began to reconsider all of the evidence around 2010, eras of homework collected over the years, and eventually concluded that the real execution spot was Proctor's Ledge. Boom, baby! This was confirmed in 2016. Part of the evidence included 1692 eyewitnesses' accounts who wrote in journals that they were able to see the hangings from their homes to actually remains being dug up and found now. Now I know what you're thinking, it's named after John Proctor. No it's not. However, odd timing as he was one of the witches accused of witchcraft along with three of his other mistresses. Locals say that the lady in white visits Proctor's ledge. Some visitors claim to have caught the sight of her, though others catch only her disembodied voice. Are these the phantoms of the unsettled spirits tied to the grounds where they were hanged for eternity? Who knows? In our third spot today, we have Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, otherwise known as Ursula Sonthiel, was born in 1488 England. Legend has it that she was born during a massive thunderstorm and her mother gave birth to her in a cave. Her mother was only 15 at the time and was stuck raising Ursula in that cave by herself. That was until the monastery took her mother in and a local family took Ursula in. Eventually her mom was taken to a nunnery and they never saw each other again. Growing up, Ursula had a hard time fitting in. She had a large crooked nose, her back had a bend in it, and her legs were twisted. So right off the bat, people were like, yeah, she's a witch, just because of her appearance. In fact, people would bully her and call her hag face. Others believed her father was the devil. It didn't help that her mom refused to tell anyone who the father of her child was. So people were like, yeah, for sure. Her father's the devil. Not only that, she would spend a lot of time by the cave that she was born in. Now, how did she get the name Mother Shipton? Well, eventually she went on to marry a man named Tobias Shipton, and she took his last name. She eventually did partake in witchcraft and would make magical remedies for the sick. So people called her Mother Shipton because she was like a mother to all. At one point in her life, she became psychic and could see into the future. Soon after, she was called the Narenboro Witch. She made a living off of predicting and sharing the future with others. Moving on to number two, we have Isabel Godey. Isabel Godey was a Scottish woman from Aldern, a village near the Scottish Highlands. She is well known in history because in 1662, she confessed to witchcraft and may have been executed. We actually don't know because there's no official record of it, so it's a mystery. Basically, during that time, if you were thought to be a witch, they would torture you until you admitted to being one, even if you weren't actually one. Well, Isabel's case sparked a lot of interest because she admitted to being a witch willingly without torture or anything. And she went into great detail on everything that she was doing. She gave four separate confessions given over a six week period. For example, she said she made a pact with the devil and had been engaging in intercourse with him. She also said that she was part of a coven and would cast spells on the community. She claimed she put a curse on some male authority figures who she felt victimized by. She also cursed her landlord for being a pervert and put one on the local church minister. Lastly, she also admitted that she had the ability to turn into animals and that she was interacting with fairies. Over the centuries, a number of people have analyzed Isabel and have come up with some explanations for her actions. One is that she suffered from psychosis or hallucinations, whereas others think it was a ploy to get maybe a more lenient sentence. But of course, you still have the people who believe that she was an actual witch and did everything that she admitted to doing. And in our number one spot today, we have La Voisine. Catherine Montvoisine or La Voisine was a witch that lived in France in the mid 1600s. Her witchcraft mainly comprised of mixing and creating potions, poisons, and medicines. She also would tell people their fortunes and would hold black masses where people could come and make contact with the devil through her. It started off with her just providing palm readings and advice for people. But then she realized that her clients were mainly women who were coming to her with spousal problems. A number of them wanted their husband dead. 
so she started creating the potions to help them kill their husbands and gain fortune. Then things started to get darker and darker. She began practicing dark magic and witchcraft. This involved her leading a number of satanic rituals in the catacombs under her home. One time she even spilled the blood of an innocent victim as a sacrifice for the devil. Eventually Catherine was arrested for practicing witchcraft and for being involved in a number of murders. She was publicly burned at the stake in 1680. Taking us off in fifth place, we have Tatuba, one of the first women to be accused of witchcraft during the Salem witch trials of 1692-93. to It is believed that she was taken from her tribe and forced into slavery in Barbados, where she learned her skills in witchcraft from mistresses and other slaves. When the head of her plantation passed, she was inherited by minister Samuel Paris and was then brought to Salem, Massachusetts. Tatuba was accused of practicing witchcraft by a young woman, Abigail Williams and Elizabeth Paris, who also happened to be the daughter of her owner. The girls had been showing signs of being bewitched, and it was believed that Tatuba told the girls tales of voodoo and witchcraft prior to said accusations. A neighbor of the Paris family, Mary Sibley, recommended a witch's cake be baked to reveal the names of the witches, and instructed Tatuba to bake a rye cake with the victim's urine and feed the cake to a dog. Dogs were believed to support witches and their supernatural powers by following the witch's requests. When the symptoms shown by the young woman did not pass, this was shown as evidence that Tatupa possessed the powers of witchcraft. She was allowed to speak in court, becoming the first person to confess to practicing witchcraft in Salem in March of 1962. She also confessed to speaking with the devil, stating that he ordered her to worship him and hurt the children of the village, along with discussing tales of black dogs, hogs, a yellow bird, red and black rats, cats, a fox, and a wolf that she had cursed. She was sent to jail in Boston to await trial and punishment on March 7, eventually stuck in jail until being sold to an unknown person for the price of her jail fees that Samuel had refused to pay. Coming in fourth, Mole Dyer, one of the witches that inspired the Blair Witch Project. Residing in Leonardtown, Maryland, her origins are clouded in mystery, the most popular theory being that she was a noblewoman escaping an unsavory past. Taking up an isolated residence outside of town limits, she developed a reputation as a skilled herbalist. Those skills, combined with her unknown past and secluded lifestyle, planted the suspicion of witchcraft in villagers' heads. In the winter of 1697, the weather was so harsh that many crops failed and a deadly plague swept through the town. It is believed that these were revenge from Maul, after the townspeople had been blaming her for every misfortune and hardship they faced. A meeting was held amongst town vigilantes, and they decided to form a mob to run her out of town. They set fire to her cottage in the dark of night, and Maul ran until her legs gave out, kneeling by a large rock. She raised her hand to the sky, calling down a further curse to the townspeople, and eventually froze to that same rock, leaving her handprint as a notice of her final act. The boulder has since been preserved as a landmark, and even though the handprint is no longer clearly visible, visitors have reported feeling profoundly uncomfortable or experiencing terrible aches and pains around it, and cameras have been known to malfunction in its presence. On the coldest nights of the year, people have reported seeing a woman with long white hair and wearing a white dress walking through the fields and woods near the town. Number three, Charter Street Burial Grounds. The Charter Street Burial Grounds started in 1637, also known as Old Burying Point, or the Charter Street Cemetery, is the oldest cemetery in Salem. Many early and famous Salem residents are buried here, such as John Hawthorne, a judge in the Salem Witch Trials of 1692. Hawthorne, whose father had been a Salem magistrate, was born in 1641 and had six children. Hawthorne experienced several deaths in his family, including those of all his three brothers. Hawthorne died in 1717 at the age of 76, never apologizing for the role in the Salem Witch Trials. His headstone is surrounded by granite rectangles to help preserve what is left of the original stone. Being one of the oldest cemeteries and the sickening things that happen there, ghosts and spirits are often seen around the gravesite. There have been many strange occurrences here. Which stuff aside, about 400 years of ghostly encounters have happened at the old Burying Point Cemetery. Over the years, people have successfully captured EVP of voices from beyond the grave at the site. If you can hear me, say something. Stop yelling. Oh, sorry. Photographs of mysterious shadows, orbs, white mist, and even full apparitions are seen here. One of these apparitions is believed to be Mary Bright Corey, who died 1684. She was the second wife of Giles Corey, who later became an unfortunate victim of the witch trials himself. 
Another ghost seen is the powdered blue dress lady, whilst holding a picnic basket in one hand and sometimes accompanied by a young boy. Normally, once the cameras come out, the lady in white transitions into numerous bright orbs or vanishes altogether. Maybe the ghost woman is the same Mary Corey forever watching over Judge Hawthorne's grave. Number two, Gallows Hill. Okay, so we were just talking about what happened to some of the accused during these hysterical trials and all the historical places that saw such violence. One of the most interesting witches tried of that was Giles Corey. Tried as a witch, but never hanged. Actually, the old man known as Giles Corey was pressed to death with the judge's orders of him being a strong and stubborn old man and would not for the life of him indulge in the nonsense he was being accused for. He never admitted that he was a witch, even throughout his torture. They laid him down and put a board on his back and proceeded to stone him to death, piling up stones on the board, resulting in crushing and eventually perishing underneath it. Only took about four days. Giles Corey apparently repeatedly yelled more weight, further cementing his plea of not guilty to everyone watching at Gallows Hill. With his last breath, Giles apparently cursed the town of Salem, and this area is now an unearthly hotspot for paranormal activity. The Gallows Hill that most people are aware of is nothing but a baseball diamond, but underneath that baseball diamond, bone fragments and coffins have been found. Interesting, because no witches were ever buried in coffins. Maybe vampires? Giles died from his inflicted torture on September 19th, 1692, just after the eighth anniversary of his wife Mary's passing. Strange sounds emerge from the area at night, including loud knockings, thumpings that wake up neighbors from their bed, and of course, the full-bodied apparitions said to walk the grounds yelling in the middle of the night. There have been full-bodied apparitions spotted within the woods, with disembodied voices shrieking in the middle of the night. The disturbingly loud voices yelled throughout the area have had some locals scratching their heads. Is this the ghost of Giles himself, speaking his curse upon the town for all to hear? Shh! Trying to sleep! And coming in at number one, House of Seven Gables. Locals say the Turner Ingersoll Mansion, or also known as famously the House of Seven Gables, is the most haunted spot in Salem. How many haunted spots are there? Ghosts are just like really competitive. Now a prominent museum protected in its original form, used for plays and reenactments by the locals, the original structure was simple in nature, with only two and a half rooms and just under three stories tall. By the time of John Turner's death, the prominent merchant, sea captain, and owner of the house he was one of the most wealthy men in the entirety of Massachusetts. Turner and Ingersoll's House of the Seven Gables is a ghostly reminder of the tormented souls both trying and being tried at the time of the hangings. But the Turner Ingersoll is a reminder for more than just lost shipping fortunes and curses, as it's also a homely reminder of Judge Hawthorne himself and the guilt he inflicted on that town. As records show, Hawthorne may have feigned sympathy for the accused witches, but he never regretted his involvement in their trials or executions. And he certainly never expressed any remorse during the trials themselves for sending the accused to their death. Following the witch hysteria of the late 1600s, the Hawthorne family lost most of their wealth, no doubt influenced by the families of the accused witches who sought out justice for their dead loved ones. Acting now as only a museum of historic place, each year the museum hosts a series of theatrical plays, all of which surrounding the Salem witch trials. Such plays titled as Legacy of the Hanging, Judge Hawthorne, and Spirits of the Gables. But some of the actors aren't, well, very alive. As for the ghosts outside of the theatrical performance as well, everybody's got their own opinions on that. But tour guides and employees tend to avoid the attic where some people have complained about being choked by ghostly figures. Attack! Attack! Local lore has many different stories to tell and so do many of the visitors who enter Salem's most haunted house. Others report seeing a phantom boy who enjoys playing in the attic. Throughout the day, his giggles and laughs can be heard. Always giggling kids, eh? They're like the scariest ghosts. Well, that's about all the proof and lore I need to believe it. Imagine doing a show and a ghost just saying, line? Number five on this list has got to go to SCP-4595. Now, SCP-4595 is unlike anything on this list because believe it or not, it's actually a place. That's right, this is a small shed that is located in Indiana. The shed contains a few standard items, a nice wooden bench to sit on, a shovel in case you needed to do some yard work, oh, and the remains of an adolescent boy. You know, just standard shed stuff. Written on the door of this shed in black, 
black charcoal all in capital letters is the word witch. It is said that underneath this shed is the remains of a female figure. She forever resides roughly a meter underground and for some reason does not decompose at all her body still looking as it would if she were alive. If you do happen to stumble upon this shed don't go in. It's said that at first you just feel as if somebody is watching you. A little creepy but we can deal with that. Part 2 of what happens isn't as friendly. It's said that after extended exposure to this area one will attempt to scratch themselves violently causing horrible injuries. If for some reason and after violently scratching yourself, you thought, huh, maybe I'll dig underground and disturb whatever is underneath, then that will be the last thing that you do. Desert locusts will fill your lungs, air cavities, pretty much anywhere that you intend to breathe, and suffocate you from the inside until you die. Basically, guys, if you ever see any weird looking sheds in Indiana, just walk in the other direction. Coming in at number four, we have SCP 5351, or also known as the Witch of Words. This witch is especially scary because if you let your guard down for a second, it can strike. It's kept at site 22, but there is no audio recording of SCP-5351, and no one is allowed to quote or repeat anything it says. This is because if they do, they could be killed. Although SCP-5351 might resemble a young Slavic woman, I want to warn you that there is nothing human about this creature. If anyone is to repeat anything that it says, whether that be in person or through text, SCP-5351 will immediately appear in front of that individual and kill them on the spot. Although the death might be swift, it is a brutal one. Reports say that the Witch of Words will maul her humans to death with her bare hands, showing inhuman levels of strength. For somebody whose brain likes to wander, speaking about myself here people, having somebody who will literally kill you if you ever utter something that she has previously said is pretty scary. The one positive is that plants really like to grow around her and often grow in places that they normally wouldn't. If we could just cut the whole brutally killing people thing, I mean she'd make a pretty good botanist. Third place, Ray Sherwood, the last convicted witch of Virginia. Also known as the Witch of Pungo, she was born in 1660 to carpenter John White and his wife Susan and married her husband, farmer James Sherwood, in 1680, whom she birthed three sons with. Grace was a renowned healer, growing her own herbs on their land, also acting as a midwife. While no official paintings or drawings of her exist, she is described as very attractive and tall, with a sense of humor. She was known to wear trousers instead of dresses while doing yard work, something almost unheard of at the time. The first accusation of wrongdoing against her came in 1697, when Richard Capps accused her of using a spell to end the life of his bull, of which the court could not make a decision. Grace and her husband filed a countersuit which was settled out of court. In 1698, Grace was then accused by neighbor John Gisburn of enchanting his pigs and cotton crop. No court action was taken this time, and another countersuit by the Sherwoods went nowhere. In that same year, Elizabeth Barnes alleged that Grace had taken the form of a black cat, entered the Barnes's home, jumped over her bed, whipped her, and left through the keyhole. The allegations went nowhere. Same for the countersuit, leaving the Sherwood couple to pay court fees for the third time. After her husband's death in 1701, Grace managed to dodge further allegations until 1705 when she got into a fight with neighbor Elizabeth Hill. She sued Elizabeth and her husband for a battery and was awarded damages of 20 shillings, so roughly the equivalent to 170 Canadian dollars today. In March, the Princess Anne County Justices assembled two juries, both made up of women, with the first being ordered to search Elizabeth's home for wax or baked items that might indicate she was a witch. Led by Elizabeth Hill herself, Grace was examined by the second jury of 12 ancient and knowing women, appointed to look for markings on her body that might be brands of the devil. And they discovered two marks not like theirs or like those of any other woman known to them. On July 5th, the justices ordered a trial by ducking to take place. If Grace were to sink, she would be deemed innocent. If she were to float and survive, she would be declared as guilty and imprisoned. Around 10 a.m. on July 10th, she was taken down a dirt lane now known as Witch Duck Road to a plantation near the mouth of the Lynn Haven River. The event attracted people from all over the colony, who began to shout, Duck the Witch! It is believed that her right thumb was bound to her left big toe and her left thumb to her right big toe, and then she was flung into the water where she quickly floated to the surface. The sheriff then tied a 13-pound Bible around her neck, causing her to sink, but she untied herself and returned to the surface, cementing her status as a witch. She was then imprisoned for eight years and lived quietly until her death in 1740. According to legend, her sons placed her body near the fireplace, and a wind came down the chimney, with her corpse disappearing amongst the embers. 
murderers. The only clue left behind was a cloven hoof print. Stories about the devil taking her body, unnatural storms, and loitering black cats quickly arose after her death, and local men ended the life of every feline they could find. This widespread elimination of cats is believed to have caused the infestation of rats and mice in 1743. In our second place position, we're traveling over to 1662 Scotland, where Isabel Gowdy, housewife to John Gilbert, residents of the Aldern region, and that's about all we know of her personal life. <laughs> it is believed that she was tortured before her confession. Methods used at the time included the use of thumb screws, foot roasting, witch pricking to test for a devil's mark, sleep deprivation, or isolation with food and water restrictions. Ugh. The specific details of the original accusation or reason for her confession are unknown, but are believed to be part of a conspiracy to torment the local minister, Harry Forbes, who was a zealous extremist who had a fear of witchcraft. And for a woman who would not have been taught to read or write, she was extremely eloquent. Her first confession described an encounter with the devil in the church at night, where she renounced her baptism and the devil put his mark on her shoulder before sucking her blood from it. Other meetings took place at several locations, where she recounted having sexual inter with the devil, who she described as a very cold and rough but great man. She detailed his appearance as having forked and cloven feet that were sometimes covered with shoes or boots. Details were given of taking a child's body from a grave and spoiling crops, along with information about covens and where they danced. The coven ate and drank the best of food at houses they reached by flying through the air on magical horses and entered through the windows, where they were entertained by the Queen of the Fairies in her home at Downey Hill, which was filled with water bowls that frightened Isabel. She claimed to have made made clay figures of the male offspring of the owner of her land to cause them suffering or death, and that she had assumed the form of a jackdaw bird with other members of the coven who had transformed into animals like cats and hares. Some parts of her testimony, such as her description of the king and queen of the fairies, has been cut short when the notaries have just noted, etc., because they were unable to keep pace with the volume of information being narrated to them. A little over two weeks later, on May 3rd, Isabel's second confession was transcribed. She expanded on details about the coven by providing the nicknames of its members, and as many of the spirits that waited on them as she could remember, including her own servant spirit, whom she called Red River, who dressed all in black. Claims included once again having the ability to transform into animals, with the individual chance used supplied. Over the duration of all of her confessions, a total of 27 benevolent or malevolent chants were given, more than in any other British witchcraft case. She testified that the devil handmade elf arrows that were then enhanced by small, roughly spoken elf boys. The devil allocated a number of arrows to each coven member with instructions that they were to be fired in his name. If the intended target, human or animal, was touched by the arrow, she claimed that they would pass, even if wearing protective armor. Spells used to inflict illness and torment on local minister Harry Forbes were also described. On May 15th, Isabel was brought before her interrogators for a third time. Same as her first two confessions, the transcript begins by detailing her pact with the devil. Taking the information she provided previously about the elf arrows a step further, she revealed the names of those whose lives she had ended, along with supplying names of other coven members with details of who they had unalived. She described an instance where the devil had sent her to run an errand, disguised as a hare, and how well in that form she was chased by a pack of dogs until she was able to utter the chant to transform herself back into a human. She mentioned that while dogs could not kill her in that disguise, any marks sustained would still show after returning to human form. Descriptions of dining with the devil along with salacious details concerning sexual relations with said devil and broad characteristics of his were chronicled. The fourth and final confession on May 27th was mainly to confirm the three previous testimonies and an attempt to elicit more information about the members of the coven. After the six weeks that it took to record her testimonies, the panel of interrogators believed they had enough proof to request a trial from the Privy Council, which was granted. While there is no official record of the exact trial outcome, it is believed that Isabel would have been found guilty and following the verdict would have been transported by cart to Gallow Hill, where she would have been subject to a public strangulation and burning the posthumous burning to ensure that she couldn't haunt the community from beyond her grave. Granted, locals to the area claim that she is the green lady that can be seen haunting them to this day. Finally, in first place, we have the only male witch on this list, Grigory Rasputin, close family friend of the last royal Russian family. He was originally introduced to them as a faith healer who could aid their only son, Alexei, who suffered from hemophilia. A self-described mystic and holy man, he was a figure of much debate amongst the royal court, with some describing him as a 
a visionary and prophet, others as a charlatan and scam artist. Historians believe that his scandalous reputation and influence over the Romanovs helped to discredit and overthrow the family. Having taken many pilgrimages to holy monasteries, he developed a reputation as a reverent holy man, gaining a small circle of followers who believed in his miracles, and began leading private prayer meetings, much to the scorn and suspicion of villagers and priests. It was rumored that female followers were ceremonially washing him before each meeting, that the group sang strange songs, and even that they had joined a religious sect whose rituals were rumored to include self-flagellation and sexual orgies. Word of Rasputin's activity and charisma began to spread in Siberia during the early 1900s, where he developed many friendships with high-ranking religious leaders, eventually leading to his introduction to the royal family. It's not certain when Rasputin first acted as Alexei's healer, with the earliest record on date being when he was summoned by Alexandra to pray for Alexei when he had an internal hemorrhage in the spring of 1907, with the young royal healing by the next morning. Due to his closeness with the family, Rasputin was allowed intimate access in situations that governesses to the church described as inappropriate. One governess in particular was released from her position simply for voicing her concerns about Rasputin being allowed around the children while they were clad in nothing but their nightgown. Another of the nursery governesses claimed in the spring of 1910 that she was seduced into sexual acts against her will by Rasputin, having originally been a devotee of him but was later disillusioned. The Empress refused to believe her and said that everything Rasputin does is holy, later dismissing the governess. It was whispered in society that Rasputin had seduced not only the Tsarina but also the four young Grand Duchesses. Rasputin had released passionate letters written to him by the Tsarina and the four young Grand Duchesses that throughout society fueled the rumors. In 1916, a group of nobles led by Prince Felix Yusupov banded together, deciding to assassinate the holy man for his influence over Alexandria and her family. It is said that the prince invited Rasputin to his place shortly after midnight, where he offered the man tea and cakes, which had been laced with cyanide. Rasputin initially refused the cakes, but then began to eat them, and to Felix's surprise, appeared unaffected by the poison. Rasputin then asked for wine, which had also been poisoned, and drank three glasses, but still showed no sign of distress. At around 2.30 in the morning, Felix excused himself to go upstairs, where his fellow conspirators were waiting. He grabbed a revolver and returned to the basement, telling Rasputin that he'd better look at the crucifix and say a prayer, referring to the crucifix in the room, and then shot him once in the chest. Rasputin leapt up from the bullet and attacked Felix, who freed himself with some effort and fled upstairs. Rasputin then followed Felix outdoors, where he was shot once again and collapsed into a snowbank. The group of men then wrapped his body in cloth, drove it to the Petrovsky Bridge, and dropped it into the Malaya Nevka River. Number five on this list is what I'm going to be nicknaming the Scottish Witch from the Woods. I stumbled across a Scottish story about a witch where they were unable to discover her name. Hundreds of years ago, when Scotland was still being first developed, there was a village in the north of the country. This village was positioned directly next to a forest that they wanted to chop down and expand into. When they began their process of chopping down the forest, a witch, or the Witch of the Woods, came out and warned them that if they continued, she would curse their entire community. The women would become infertile, the crops would never grow, and people would go missing. Fearing for their safety, the group came to an agreement with this witch, where they were allowed to chop down a small section of the forest in exchange for leaving one sack every harvest of grain or produce by the edge of the forest. This agreement held true for quite a while until the community started to get less fearful and more greedy. They decided to go against this witch and chop down the rest of the forest without fear of consequence. When the witch came out of the forest again to address their betrayal, they refused to listen and they hung her immediately. Right before she was executed though, she said that the new price was three bags of grain. This fell on deaf ears though, except for one fearful farmer that decided to heed the warning for a little while. The community went on thriving until one once again, that farmer's fear was replaced with greed. He stopped delivering the grain, and that very same day, his youngest daughter went missing. The community looked everywhere, but nobody could find her until somebody checked the mill. Through the bricks and all over the walls, blood started dripping down to the ground, and they knew exactly where his daughter went. That mill has since been torn down, but it was replaced with a silo. And to this day, the locals in that area still think that that silo is haunted by the Scottish Witch in the Woods. Number four on this list goes to the Paisley Witches. The Paisley Witches are actually nicknamed after the town of Paisley in Scotland, where these witches were based. 
Christian Shaw was an 11 year old girl who was the daughter of a higher up in the Scottish community. It was this 11 year old girl who fell victim to the curse of several witches. It started with a deep sickness that manufactured itself like any other fevers, chills, exhaustion. But some reports say that it became much more than that. The story goes that Shaw, on one occasion, levitated from her bed and on another occasion started chanting some deep curse. It was clear to everybody involved, including Shaw, that some form of Scottish witchcraft was a foot. Now she made it evident that she believed multiple witches were involved in causing her ailment, seven of them in fact. A trial was held for these witches where it was discovered that they all had the witch's mark or the devil's mark as some like to call it on their bodies. After this evidence came to light, the jury's decision was easy and all of the witches were sentenced to death. Now this story was a long time ago and it's hard to know for certain whether these individuals had anything to do with Shaw's ailment and witchcraft or if they were wrongly accused, tried improperly and the story has been exaggerated over time, which frankly is not unlike other potential witch stories during this period. The only thing that we can say for certain though is that the people back then and the 11 year old Christian Shaw believed wholeheartedly that this group of paisley witches was just that. Witches. Coming in at number 3 we have SCP-239 or as some people like to call her, the witch child. The witch child looks like a young blonde haired girl of 8 years old, however this girl has had one harsh upbringing. Ever since birth, SCP-239 has been under SCP care. This is because only 3 hours after her birth, the hospital that she was born at exploded in an unexplained way. The public was told that it was a freak accident from a gas leak, but we suspect now that it was much more. With shimmering grey eyeballs and the constant emission of radioactive energy, SCP-239 has the ability to control things. She must be conscious and must be able to see the object or creature that she intends to manipulate, but beyond that, she has the capability to do anything. It has been reported that she has simply wished away a human being before, making them disappear completely, and then when she feels fit to do so, wish them back and make them reappear. The limits of the witch child's power are currently unknown, however it is clear that they are extensive. That is why she currently resides in a cell coated with telekill alloy and can only be interacted with class 2 personnel. Not the type of child that you want to be leaving at daycare. Coming in at number 2 we have SCP-3998 also known as the Wicker Witch. The Wicker Witch is a scarecrow of human remains that are covered in 4 degree burns. Its body is bruised and beaten and held together by wire and nails. Yeah, this is not the type of scarecrow you want on grandpa's ranch. In fact, SCP-3998 is extremely dangerous. However, it is very selective with who its victims will be. The Wicker Witch only targets individuals who have killed or been violent with a loved one. These loved ones need to be somebody you are romantically involved with. If you have done this and you are in the presence of SCP-3998, then the next few minutes of your life will not be pleasant. It is said that it starts with mild pain to the back of your head. It escalates very quickly though. Next is when the acid comes into play. Your stomach fills up with the stuff until you start throwing up this putrid vial onto yourself. That that quickly escalates to your whole body burning itself down, your own body fat melting away, until all that's left are the horribly burned remains that is not dissimilar in appearance to SCP-3998 itself. Number 1 on our list is SCP-352 or Baby Yaga. Baby Yaga once again strays away from the typical spell casting witch and lives far more in the world of Hansel and Gretel. Yeah, the whole I'm gonna eat you type of witch. SCP-352 resembles a very old old Russian woman with an extremely harsh Russian accent which can be very difficult to translate. At this current point, no one has any idea about her origins, but we do know that she is unlike most elderly women. You know Spider-Man? Well imagine that, but an old Russian lady that is super scary and wants to eat you. That's sort of what we're dealing with right now guys. Baby Yaga has exceptional strength and speed and it is reported that she can run at 70 miles per hour. She can also be completely decapitated and regenerate herself, making her almost impossible to kill. Her hair acts as webbing that she can extend at will and trap people in. Once trapped, she touches them with her skin, which excretes a chemical that then sends you into a deep hallucinogenic state where you can't feel any pain. While you're off in La La Land though, 
she isn't sleeping. She's slowly decapitating your body and eating you over the span of a week. At least by that point, you are totally out of it. But still, getting eaten over the course of a week by an old spider like Russian lady, that's not really what I want on my tombstone, my friends. Be scary enough on its own, but time to elaborate, I suppose. These manuscripts were believed to be written in the early 1900s, as their first library appearance was around the 1920s. These books originated when a Wiccan high priestess called Persephone Adrast. Irene recorded her family's spiritual history of being an American witch of Swedish and English ancestry. These manuscripts record Persephone's witchy history that she reworked all through her adult life, incorporating her mother's grimoire into them as well. The first book contains around 250 pages of spells, incantations, curses, and enchantments, as well as corresponding information on gems, planets, rites, potions, and even exorcisms. The second book includes around 150 to 200 pages of alchemy and chemistry recipes, cures, perfumes, and balms nerve tonics, and even hairspray recipes. I could use that. The first book is believed to carry the curse heavier than its counterpart, as Persephone's spells are believed in Wiccan culture to contain more power than most other records due to the embodiment of herself within them. Originally, the books belonged to Alice Montserrat, the wife of Israel Rigardi, who moved to the UK in the 1920s to work with famous occult writer Aleister Crowley. If you know, you know. Later on, they both went on to work with the Golden Dawn Order and printed their works and publications as occultism raised into the modern world. Though Montserrat did little reporting on the cursed lore over these books, she did make notes as to why she and others within the Order believe the curse carried some serious weight. She made a note to an inscription warning all those who read it, saying, To those not of the craft, the reading of this book is forbidden. Proceed no further, or justice will exact a swift and terrible retribution, and you will surely suffer at the hand of the craft. This was written not only in English, but other languages as well to ensure the reader be heavily warned to uh, keep away. To this day, copies of the Untitled Grimoires can be bought from M. Benjamin Katz Fine Books and Rare Manuscripts in Toronto. They still come with a high warning for all non-believers within Wiccan or Pagan beliefs to shy away from them because of the cursed lore within and surrounding their pages. As tempting as it might be to acquire a copy, since that is a place I could technically travel to, I don't want to risk fate. My life is crazy enough. Trust me. Number four, the Grand Grimoire. Yep, it's a black magic grimoire. And for reference, because I don't think I elaborated last time, a grimoire is a textbook of magic. You know, it typically includes instructions on how to create magical objects like talismans and amulets, how to perform magical spells, charms and divination, and how to summon or invoke supernatural entities such as angels, spirits, deities, and demons. In many cases, the books themselves are believed to be imbued with magical powers. Although in many cultures, other sacred texts that are not grimoires, such as the Bible, have been believed to have supernatural powers intrinsically. The only contents found in a grimoire would be information on spells, rituals, the preparations of magical tools, and lists of ingredients and their magical counterparts. In this manner, while all books of magic could be thought of as grimoires, not all magical books should be thought of as grimoires. Different editions date this specific one to 1521, 22, or 1421, but it was probably written during the early 19th century. Some experts suggest that 1702 is when the first edition may have been created as a Bibliothèque Bleu version, similar to a chapter book since that version was published in 1750. The introductory chapter was authored by Antonio Veneziana del Rabina, who gathered his information from original writings of King Solomon. Much of the material of this grimoire derives from the Key of Solomon and Lesser Key of Solomon, which are grimoires attributed to, you guessed it, King Solomon. Known as Le Dragon Rouge, or the Red Dragon, this book contains instructions on how to summon Lucifer, or Lucifer Refocal, for the purpose of forming a deal with the devil. The 19th century French occultist Eliphas Lévy, author of Dogme et Rituel de la Haute Magie, claimed the contemporary edition of Le Dragon Rouge was a counterfeit of a true older Grand Grimoire. And I just, I love petty historical spats. The overall work is divided into two books. The first book contains instructions for summoning a demon and for the construction of tools with which to force the demon to do one's bidding. Now the second book is divided further into two parts. The Sanctum Regnum et Secret de l'Armergie du Grand Grimoire. The Sanctum Regnum contains instructions for making a pact with the demon, allowing one to command the spirit without the tools required by book one, but at a greater risk. Secrets contain simple spells and rituals one can employ after having performed the ritual of the first book. Some editions contain a short text between these two parts, known as Le Secret Magique ou Le Grand Art de Pouvoir Par or in English, the magic secret or the grand art of being able to speak with the dead, which deals with necromancy. The book describes several demons as well as the rituals to summon them in order to make, you know, a pact with them. It also details several spells for winning a lottery, talking to spirits, being loved by somebody else, making oneself invisible, and more. This book mentions three greater demons, which are similarly prioritized in the Grimorium Verum. 
Sidebar, in the English translation of the work, the demons are referenced by the more generic term of spirits, which is a term I know some modern Satanists prefer. I'm kind of partial to demons. The demons that are mentioned are the Emperor Lucifer, Prince Beelzebub, and Grand Duke Astaroth. Now this book also makes mention of six lesser demons, and of course I'm going to mention them all. So we already know Lucifer Shrofokad, Prime Minister, Satanachia, Commander-in-Chief, Agliarept, Commandant, Fleurotti, Lieutenant General, Sagatanas, Brigadier Major, Nebiros, Marshal and Inspector General. Number three on this list is Helen Duncan. Helen Duncan was a Scottish witch who traveled throughout Europe and actually isn't that far removed from present day. She died in 1956 and is known by some to be the last Scottish witch. As a young girl, she was considered by most to be a normal, albeit outspoken and loud, growing child. It wasn't until midway through her life that she started seriously practicing witchcraft. Helen garnered a name for herself by regularly performing seances every evening and having the ability to communicate with the dead. During her nightly rituals, she would invite viewers to come and watch. These viewers had reported seeing the materialization of ghostly figures directly in front of their eyes when Helen entered her deep, witchly trance. Helen was also capable of and would often excrete a strange looking ectoplasm from her mouth while she was doing this. And if this wasn't enough, Duncan could also see things that others couldn't. At one point, the ghost of a sailor appeared and talked about a very secretive incident that had happened in World War II that the public, or Helen Duncan, couldn't have possibly known about. After hearing this information, the authorities realized that they couldn't have Duncan revealing any important state secrets about the war and arrested her for witchcraft immediately. It was revealed during her trial that some of her witchy ways were not what people were led to believe though. Like her ectoplasm was simply the regurgitation of a cheesecloth made to look like some type of ghostly substance. Even though some of her abilities were proven to be fraudulent, it still doesn't explain how she was able to accurately predict or say the things that she couldn't have possibly known. Helen Duncan didn't use any of her abilities to harm anyone, but the capability to potentially talk to the dead, it's still very chilling. Number two on this list is Thomas Weir and his sister Grizel. What makes Thomas and his sister so scary is that nobody expected them to be involved in witchcraft at all. Up until the end of his life, Thomas was known by most to be a nice man of the community held in high esteem. However, nearing the end of his life, Thomas came clean about who he really was telling the entire community during a religious service that he and his sister had been performing witchcraft for years. Going into deep detail about how they had consistent communication with the devil and had devoted their entire lives to carrying out his bidding. This bidding manifested itself in many different ways, most of which involved causing harm to others or in Thomas's case, getting it on with animals. Yeah. He was a weird dude. At first the community barely believed him, but after the sister came out and corroborated his story in detail as well, they started piecing it together. Thomas was always walking around with a big black staff. The neighbors had reported hearing strange sounds in the evening coming from their home and weird lights going off. Suddenly the guy that everybody thought they knew as their nice friendly neighbor was somebody else entirely. Reports say that when he was burned at the stake, he took far longer to die than a human should. Also his staff was burned with him and it emitted an extremely strange sound and moved in unnatural directions when it was burning as if it was being possessed by some force. I suppose that in the case of Thomas and Grizel, they had done such a good job at hiding their identities as witches and had been extremely methodical with their crimes that before they died, they just had to let the world know just how evil they actually were. Number one on this list is Isabel Gowdy. Isabel was a Scottish witch from the 1600s and frankly, she did everything. Through several confessions that she made on her own accord, without the pressure of torture or coercion from higher ups. Isabel admitted to taking part in a wide array of witchcraft activities. She admitted that she had freely let the devil suck blood from her neck and that she had romantic relationships with the devil before. She admitted to taking the body out of child's graves and using it in a ritual to destroy people's crops. She said that she had made clay effigies or voodoo dolls of someone's children and used these to harm and even kill them. Isabel was also part of a coven, a group of witches whose intentions were evil and had the ability to change their form into animals. 
She described in detail the brutal murders that she had committed for the devil and her fellow witches. She even offered up information about spells they had used to inflict illnesses on people, uttering some of them to the council she was confessing to. Now it's unclear exactly why Isabel decided to confess to these heinous crimes and oust herself as being a witch. She had to be aware that confessing to these crimes of this nature would surely mean her execution. It had been said though that she felt extreme guilt for her crimes and that's why she decided to come forward and accept the consequences as they were. Regardless of what her intentions were though, Isabel Gowdy has to go down as one of the most dangerous known witches in Scottish history.